Hey. Hello. I'm here in the studio. Heck yeah. It's great. I've got my top knot on. <laughs> Samurai style. <laughs> yeah. I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> awesome. Let's jump right into this one. It's going to be long. Yeah, I think it will be. <laughs> All right. So today we're going to be discussing the sci-fi novel, The Dispossessed by Ursula K. Le Guin. Yeah, let's jump right in. Sure. Yeah. Uh, this just kind of a background, Ursula K. Le Guin, one of the premier sci-fi sure. writers uh, in a field that historically was dominated by men. So this is literally how I shop for sci-fi fantasy books is I will go down the aisle and just stop when I see a woman's name <laughs> and I'll buy that usually. Hey, that's a big filter to put on it. It so. really is. It gets rid of a lot of bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of good things too. But yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, this was written in or published first in 1974. Okay, yes, that answers some of my questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, so let's jump into kind of a, I guess we'll do kind of a plot synopsis. Just like very brief back of the book kind of thing, you okay. know, like, what is this book about? Right, because, yeah, why are we talking about just a random science fiction book <laughs> on a communist podcast? Uh, no, this is the new podcast. Oh, shit. I didn't, <laughs> it's called okay. Teach Me Sci-Fi. Um, we're rebranding. I'm also in, so. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> All right, so this book is basically about anarchism, which is cool. Hell yeah. So the premise is you have a planet called, I'm going to pronounce it Anaris. I don't know how you say it. Anaris. Or and then, Anaris. Well, I say Anaris and then I say Anaresti for the I people. I say Anaresti for the people too. Okay. Okay, that's fine. Anyway, so it's <laughs> like a bleak desert moon and they originally came from this other planet like next door, like the planet. Mm-hmm that the moon is a moon the too. The home planet, yeah. <laughs> wow, I could not think of the word for that. <laughs> um, it's called Uras or Uras, I don't know. I always said Uras, but I always thought it was funny, like if you were a, maybe a kid there. You Uras. Could be like, yeah. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. I thought that many a juvenile joke came I'm from. I'm sure, I'm <laughs> sure. So yeah, they came from that planet and we'll talk a little bit more about how they ended up there, but they ended up colonizing this moon and, and settling down there. And they developed into like an anarchist syndicalist planet mm -hmm. while the other one is like super capitalist still. Yeah. And so the place they came from, Eurus is extremely capitalist. They kind of have like a democracy and they have multiple uh, countries there. On yes. It. Yes. Uh, and then the planet they, that the other planet, the moon of it, Anaris mm -hmm. is the anarcho syndicalist one. Yes. Okay. And then this story focuses on Shevik, a temporal physicist, and he decides to visit Uras, which hasn't been done in forever, and people are like pissed about it. And basically, he's just trying to like start communication between their worlds because they're very like uh, Anaris is very isolationist. Yes. Yeah. He's trying to break down the walls. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, how are we going to go through this? I think it'd be helpful to talk a little bit about the structure of the book first okay. because it's weird. Yeah. <laughs> that was, you're trying to like wrestle with it in the second chapter. Like, yeah. Wait, what? Where are we? Uh -huh. <laughs> so the way it's set up is chapter one is like basically present day. He's about to go to the planet. And then chapter two goes back to him as a baby. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they alternate between past and present until eventually they catch up with each other at the end. Yes, because at the end, you've got up to where he's about to leave mm -hmm. and, and the he's end of back. the other story. So yeah, okay. Yeah. But what kind of works like in the context of what the book is about? We mentioned he's a temporal physicist, Shevek yeah. was. So does that mean he makes very good vegetable tempura? Man, that would be, it's like, you know, when you go to the sandwich shop and they're like, these are a sandwich artist. Yeah, he's a tempura I don't know which place does that. Yeah, he's a tempura <laughs> physicist. Um, no, but he, he studies time. Yes, yes. The physics of time. And he's got this like principle of simultaneity mm -hmm. versus like. Basically sequence. how we normally think of time, which is it goes forward. Yeah. yeah. But he's also saying, you know, it's like a book and there's like parts that. Are later on and parts that are before but they're all actually there in this book yeah at the same time i'm not gonna lie a lot of the physics stuff i skimmed through or just went sure over yeah head. it's i mean <laughs> and it's science fiction so it's like yeah this is very speculative and imaginative and that's fine mm -hmm. but you don't have to get too bogged down in the science part yeah of it. if you want to skip that shit it's like it's nice but it's not mm -hmm. like super important i don't think i just think it lines up with the structure <laughs> it of the does book, though yes yeah. 
you've had got past and present kind of moving. Yeah, at the I same thought time. that was clever for sure. So that being said, we're not going to follow the structure of the book in our summary because that would be confusing. It would take forever. Yeah. So first, I think we should kind of talk about some of the 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 background, the world building of this book, mm -hmm. and then we can get into the plot. But we're going to go chronologically and not chapter order. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. All right. Do you want to tell us about the history of Anaris? How they got to, to where they are? I got to do history on the fictional planet too. All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, um, everyone in this system, so we're talking about the Tau Ceti system. Oh, I didn't remember that. Uh, <laughs> it's, I think that's like the closest system to us or something like that. Um, oh, really? Or one of, it's one of them. It's one oh, of the okay. very close Cute. stars we're nearby, our nearby Earth, which makes an appearance. Um, it does, yes. Everyone in this system starts out on Boris, mm -hmm. the capitalist planet. And they, uh, from their, their history seems kind of like ours. Mm -hmm. They had a feudal sort of history mm -hmm. and then eventually develop into this, you know, capitalist system. And they have different countries. They have Thu, which is like a socialist country. Mm -hmm. Benbili, which is like a dictatorship, which goes through some, sh some shit later. Yeah. There's another one, I think, that I forgot. Those are the, Those are the main three two. main ones. And then the yeah. main one is, I don't know how to say it. It's like A-I-O. Is that yeah, it? Yeah, A-I-O. I think they refer to them as like Iodins also. Yeah, let's call them Iodins. Those are the main. That's I feel like that's the powerhouse. That's that's Those the three. America. <laughs> yeah, and it, it it's almost analogous to the world Le Guin was in. I mean, you've mm -hmm. got the U.S., you've got kind of the USSR, and you've got the third world. Yeah, Billy. basically. So that's kind of what they were looking at at that point. To get to, you know, well, how did uh, Anaris get started? There was this anarchist philosopher named Odo. She was really cool. <laughs> yes. And sometimes, like, the characters are just talking about Odo, and it's almost like, oh, yeah, Odo was a woman. Yeah, like, people forget that. And yeah. it's really interesting. Like, I, I love later in the book, they some people will criticize her under the guise of, like, well, she was a woman, so she didn't get this part. Like, right, what and the you're fuck? just like, whoa, oh, shit. <laughs> um, the Odo wrote theoretical papers on the nature of man, work, play, morals, all these things. Like mm -hmm. a great philosopher. I mean, to me, that I was thinking, well, that's Marx. I mean, yeah, very Marx. I feel like she was less concerned, though, with maybe economics mm -hmm. and more about morals, which I thought was an interesting, like, strat <laughs> yes it essentially flips the ratios of mark because marx mm -hmm. he gets into definitely it too. yeah was super concerned about the human condition for him that was sort of tied up in the economic question yeah and i think for her she she went human first and was all about well that means you've got to like develop society in mm -hmm. this certain way economic you know so like that was the outgrowth of mm, considering the human question it's, de it's not compartmentalized at all. Mm -hmm. So it's like you said, the questions of like your morals or even kind of comes across sometimes as a spirituality yeah. is tied up in like the economics question, the human development question, mm -hmm. organizing society, power, all that was tied up for. Odo. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a nice philosophy. I was very into it. Yeah. Uh, I have questions about it, but <laughs> it was cool. So. When that happens and Odo's ideas start getting out there, socially the contradictions were, were coming to a head too and there's a revolution yeah. started by the cooks and the waiters. I loved that detail. Like, fuck yeah, service industry. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And they go on a general strike lasting nine months. They oh. shut the place down. Can you imagine? <laughs> I feel like alternate timeline here because things are so fucked in the service industry right now like this could happen <laughs> this you know you would think this could happen but i don't know it doesn't go into what sort of organization went on beforehand yeah to where they were ready to do that you know yeah i i think that's interesting they do kind of fall into some great man history with odo of yeah. just like oh yeah she did it and it's like no it was like hundreds of years after her that this like strike went on so I yeah don't know, it's weird well there had to be you know because we later on will encounter some like socialist organizations mm -hmm. some workers organizations organizing building networks and stuff. i mean i don't know i think that has to mm, that's a big problem with with kind of like fiction well, fiction, but I mean, in our world too, is kind of like waiting around for things to happen and not like doing the work of organizing people to be ready for that when it kicks off yeah. to jump in. 
you know? Yeah. Well, I was thinking it's very difficult in fiction to do that because like, it's hard to write about hundreds uh, and thousands of people. You just yeah. want a main character to fucking save the day. <laughs> yeah. A social movement, like a big process happened. That's yeah. Yeah. Who's gonna read that? And that's why you have like, you know, Katniss Everdeen in Hunger Games. Cause like, it's way easier to be like, yeah, she was the revolution than explaining how to organize, which no one knows how to do that. So <laughs> Yeah, so there's this revolution, and Anaris is uh, kind of offered up as uh, a compromise. Like mm -hmm. the Rasti, the the government there, they're like, "Holy shit, there's this revolution going on. <laughs> uh, what if we uh, let you guys colonize the moon?" <laughs> so yeah, they had already been like mining the moon for like metals and stuff, and. So yeah, they just gave them this moon and just said, yeah, I don't want to give up capitalism or anything, but you can have this whole other planet. <laughs> Which, like, wow, that sounds great. Yeah, I don't know. That's I was I was thinking of this like, I mean, I guess that would be if that was theoretically fine. Like, that's, would you move that's to socialist option. planet or cat or anarchist planet? I probably would because it's like that another cool. planet. Yeah, so you're very cool. into space travel. <laughs> I'm scared of it. So they, yeah, they have this back and forth. They, they settle it out to where Anaris is settled by about a hundred thousand people. So very small. Mm -hmm. Then they make kind of a treaty, the treaty of settlement. Yes. Uh, where there's a trade relationship that people kind of are annoyed about. They're like, why do I have to give these people stuff at mm -hmm. all? But there is no like movement of people between the planets at all. It's yeah. kind of isolated besides just the just trade yeah, yeah just a little bit of trade yeah they give them metals and they give them like you know stuff they can't manufacture yet basically mm -hmm. so let's talk about the planet itself environmentally um this planet <laughs> sucks <laughs> yeah it is a uh, inhospitable it's not really described as too terrible starting out you kind of mm -hmm. gradually get shown like how how bad it is yeah yeah so it's like a desert, <laughs> not great, very little greenery, dry, cold, windy, thin air, earthquakes, <laughs> mm -hmm. and they only have fish and flowerless plants. So like- They don't have animals. They don't have any yeah. animals, no birds, no big animals, nothing but fish. Yes. At some point later, he's marveling at the birds. And he's like, like, whoa, what? birds. That's, yeah. But they have this, you know, pretty diverse uh, fish. Mm-hmm ecosystem yeah you know? yeah they, they have a pretty good variety there so i guess just the planet hadn't uh changed enough to to support life like that yeah but yeah that's so that's the environment they're in that's how they got there let's talk about how they kind of set up their society yes okay so they're anarcho-syndicalists you want to give us a little class definition of that uh sure yeah so anarcho-syndicalist you're talking about well it's a form of anarchism mm -hmm. right so we are not dealing with a state uh, anarcho syndicalism organizes things through syndicates or another way we think of it in english is labor unions yes and those are it's so it's very decentralized yeah you organize kind of politically and socially at your labor union kind of level yeah so wherever you work or mm -hmm. whatever field you're in like in shevik's case he's a physicist so he works at like this institute and so that's their union basically yeah yeah and 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 you make decisions at the local level there and you kind of form voluntary associations we call it free association with these with other uh, labor unions of that sort and kind of form like a federation so kind of higher levels of coordination to, mm -hmm. to coordinate regionally and to coordinate, you know, even planet wide in, in without really having a government. It's just like delegates. It's just like, let's all, and they describe the system, this, uh, the central, this, the PDC. Yeah. The, the production and distribution coordination is decided by lottery. Like people sign yeah. up to put, they put their name on a list <laughs> to be in the, you know, the, the not government and then they're just chosen to serve for a while. Yeah, I think they only serve for four years. Mm -hmm. So there's like that natural limitation of power. It's basically like, it's all administration as opposed to government. But yeah, it's way different than what we think of as normal government. Um, and this kind of stems from the philosophy of Odo, mm -hmm. uh, who talked about, you know, the natural limit to the size of a community was in its dependence on its own immediate region for essential food and power. So, so like, you know, not all communities would be connected. It wouldn't be like from the top down. It, there's, there's no 
mm, hierarchy in that way. It's yeah. just kind of mutual aid. Yeah, very decentralized, but with cooperation. So, and I think they talk about it in the book that they they built roads before they built houses because they're like, yeah. fuck, we guys, we got to cooperate here because this is a desert. <laughs> and it's, yeah, it's the whole project is interesting to me because it's it's very utopian. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is like those guys we talked about. This is extremely utopian. Where you pack up and you leave for the unknown lands and you start your community. Yeah. And it, it's interesting because the way that it kind of fails is not the way you would expect it to fail. It's, it doesn't fail because they, you know, they ran out of food. Like, yeah, that happens, but it's that's not the reason that there is like unrest. I don't know. I think that's it's that's because this is a successful utopian yeah, project. Yeah, they did it. <laughs> they they get out the other side. They are wrestling with their own because they're also they start out and I think Shevek mentions this at some point, saying like. The original settlers were idealists, mm -hmm. were utopians, and we are practical. Uh, yes. And, and I think the main, I feel like there's two main downfalls of this utopia. One is like kind of the conflict that Shevek starts to see, like the whole bureaucracy, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But for me, I feel like the huge, huge, huge factor is the environment. Like this place was not set up to sustain human life. And like yes. that is a constant struggle. Like if this were the environment of Uras, I feel like they'd be fine. <laughs> sure, yeah, because, you know, and what Marx would say is because that's because you have abundance mm -hmm. in, in Uras and, and you and you can, like, you, ha you have enough. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to resort to this kind of barracks communism of, like, oh, we, we barely, you know, we get to eat twice a day and we have enough, but, like, it's very Spartan. Yeah. They're just not, the productive forces aren't developed enough, is and what I, you would say. I think the problem is that that scarcity leads to this administration having to be pretty strict. Yeah. And it's weird because, again, it's not like there's laws. It's just people just like that morality of Odo is so ingrained in them that they're like, yeah, I'll do it. Like, it's not an assignment, but everybody treats it like an assignment. Yeah, yeah. And that's going to be a big theme, too, is people have the opportunity at every turn it's very anarchist, like we said. So anybody can just be like, nah, don't feel like it. <laughs> no or thanks. they can just break off and do their own thing. Yeah. That's fine, but... Nobody does it. <laughs> yeah. And let's kind of talk about the kind of social forces that... But I guess, yeah, we, we kind of brought up work here. What's work look like mm -hmm. on, uh, on Anaris? Because it's pretty cool. Yeah. So the PDC, which is basically their, their administration, they basically have like a whole labor system in their computers and they can... They give out, not assignments, but they, they give out work postings, yeah. I guess. And Here's you, you where can we say, need workers. Yeah. And they say, here, we need farming here. We need whatever here. And you accept your work assignment, generally based on what you're qualified for. So it's like a, it's like monster.com, but like instead you just click <laughs> on like, yeah, I'll take that job. Yeah. You don't have to apply. <laughs> you just do it. You don't have to submit your resume four times. Oh, God. <laughs> and a cover letter. You just say, yep, A cover that's me. letter's just begging. I hate it. <laughs> So yeah, and then you work generally five to seven hours a day. What the fuck? At one point, Lovely. like Shevik's mother says something like, this hospital is crazy. <laughs> yes. People are working eight hours a day here. Yes, they're like, oh, they're severely understaffed. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh. In a hospital, can you imagine? Five uh, to seven hours a day, two to four days off every 10 days. Yeah, basically their week is set up in 10 days, it looks like. Yeah, the decad, which at first I was just like, oh man, I got to misprint this early in the book. but. <laughs> Yeah, it yeah. just means 10 days. And basically you work out those details with your crew. Like, hey, I, I want this day off every week or, you know, hey, I'm going to be gone. Yeah. Basically, like, don't be a dick is yeah. kind of the rule. That's the rule of thumb for the whole planet, basically. Be nice. And then every decade, you are called up for some sort of community labor that can be like, hey, you're going to do janitorial duty. Hey, you're going to help dig a pipe, mm -hmm. whatever it is. You're in the work crew, the cleaning brigade or mm -hmm. the... Or the road brigade or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And they, they talk about this later of like, isn't that inefficient because you're losing some training? Uh -huh. And they're like, yeah, but what else are you going to do? I'm not going to make someone do something like really hard or like something they don't want to do. Yeah. And so it's, everyone kind of, again, you have the choice to refuse, but everyone, and I, I think in this case, it's a good instance of everyone saying, well, I won't refuse though, because everyone else has to do it it's part of our communal it's our obligation to each other and i really like how in the book it's painted as pretty positive too for the most part there's some spots where it's like oh yeah that sucked but 
The like, labor, you mean, the hard the labor. The labor, yeah. yeah. Like, at one point, they're saying, like, oh, they had to lay down a pipe, and, like, it was done in, like, three hours because everyone pitched in, and, like, they all had to... They just did it. They yeah. knocked it out. And, like, it's just this really strong sense of community, which I'm like, that sounds great. Yes. Let's let's get this done, please. <laughs> Everyone's also got to be pretty buff. <laughs> True. Well, There's a lot of physical labor for yeah. the most part. So, uh, some other characteristics of society. There's no property, really. Mm -hmm. Like, there are some personal possessions, in a way... Yeah, uh, yeah. But they're very small. It's definitely, there's no private property in the Marxian sense of like, a you house. Can make, yeah, <laughs> you can make money off of it. There's communal dining, mm -hmm. nurseries, dorms, workshops, everything he describes going through a city that's just like wide open. Yeah. And you can just kind of like walk in and out of the shops if you want. It's crazy, man. I uh, That sounds great. And like, there's like neighborhoods and like sub neighborhoods yeah. and like you. Basically, you can always get to what you need on foot. And there's like a larger city where they have like some public transportation. But for the most part, it's just like you just live Which, here. <laughs> I loved the public transportation description because it was to me like a bus in Mexico is what it reminded me of. <laughs> oh, my God. Because they you're describe right. everybody like hanging off the side and like crammed in there and yes. just cheering and stuff. And I was just like. <laughs> that is very Mexico. <laughs> I also wanted to touch on this quote from Odo, which is, excess is excrement. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was very, and you could see kind of um, people's attitude toward that mm -hmm. of saying like, oh, you have, you're being a proprietarian, you have too much <laughs> stuff or what's this, this is useless. Yeah, know? like if you, like at one point he goes to somebody's room and they like haven't returned all the shit from the workshops and he's like, um, excuse you, like, yeah. <laughs> why do you have all this stuff? Why do you have things? You're not supposed to have things. Yeah. I, that feels very convenient to me because they're on this very bleak planet and like, yeah, you literally can't have excess because there's not enough to go around. Yeah. So like, I don't know, that, that felt a little... I guess convenient and like it really feeds into how they structure their houses like they can't have like artificial lighting they mm -hmm. can't well not like during the day and then like they don't heat their houses very much and like they're all about like renewable sources and stuff and i'm like how important would that be if they had more resources if they had more resources they might not be so concerned with excess you mean yeah I guess so, because at some point you'd end up with excess if you, right? Yeah. If, if you're providing just enough for people. Yeah, that would probably be something that they would have to evolve their view on. Probably. I, I mean, I just, I don't think anyone would say no to having more resources. <laughs> yeah. It provides the opportunity for more divides, though. You know, it's like, oh, some people are piling stuff up. Some people mm -hmm. are still keeping to the minimum. And then you get, you know, kind of a... A division, a hierarchy. Yeah, I guess that's true. I guess what I'm wondering is when we talk about, like you were talking about how you can still have some personal possessions. I think, I don't know, I think people got pretty extreme about that. Like, basically, it's like you have a suitcase and it just has, like, some boots in it. And yeah. Like, yeah. what if you had two suitcases? I think that'd be fine. <laughs> and it, it would. Uh, okay, I think it would be fine. Because uh, there's this one scene where he gets in and he's really hungry mm -hmm. and he goes and he's like, ah, there's a famine, but I'm getting two portions because I'm super fucking hungry because yeah. I didn't eat on the way. And it was very much like a, like from Marx, you know, to each according to his need. He kind of describes like, I exist. I don't feel I don't. bad about this because I need it. Yeah. 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 Um, but the, I think the flip side of that is that people definitely felt bad about those things because people will be judgy about people it. People were judging, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, And Shevek kind of throughout the book has this greater capacity to shake off judgments. Yeah, that's true. He's very individual in that way. And other people, you know, it kind of gets to them more, mm -hmm. the, the, the judgment part of it. So let's go back in time to baby Shevek. Baby Shevek, we start. We're going to start our recap at chapter two. Yes. <laughs> the even chapters are childhood chapters. Mm -hmm. The odd chapters are present, present, present day storyline. So, but we'll start at the beginning, so you don't have to deal with all the <laughs> jumping back and forth. Yeah. All right. I love this. The very first, basically, story of this so sets up the world. <laughs> is he's sitting in this patch of sunlight in the nursery mm -hmm. and another baby comes over and he cries about it because he gets pushed out of the sunlight and his dad picks him up and it's just like shevik you know you can't have things <laughs> <laughs> yeah because shevik's whining like it's mine yeah, i want to be there my son and 
Oh, that just cracks me up. Oh my gosh. You can't have things. What are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> people don't have things. People don't have property. The school is set up very cooperatively. They have kind of like a speaking and listening mm -hmm. class. Like that sounds like a ridiculous class to us. Like, duh, speaking and listening. <laughs> but it's important. And they're really focused on like the child's development rather than dividing up the subjects and saying, oh, well, you need to learn some science. Oh, well, you need to learn whatever. Yeah, it's very like, I think artisanal too. Like they learn a lot of craft things mm -hmm. like, oh mm -hmm. yeah, learn how to solder, or learn how to whatever. Like it's done side by side with yeah. all these other, I don't know, the speaking and listening, I mean, that's important to teach anybody. <laughs> People yeah. are bad at that. So <laughs> It's interesting that they, that it's kind of like self-guided too. Mm-hmm. Like the teachers kind of make recommendations or whatever, but you go find the group that's working on your level sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Like you're, they, Sheva gets kicked out for, <laughs> for egoizing. Oh, poor guy. He comes up with this idea. It's the paradox of the arrow. Zeno's arrow, maybe. Mm, I think okay. it's, it's a real, it's like a thing in philosophy. The whole, like the arrow will only get halfway to the tree and it will eternally get halfway. That's Just stupid. Somebody I don't you know, get it. told their bros that one day. He did some physics stuff. And anyway, yeah. So that's the first time we hear that term of egoizing. It, yeah. It basically just means like you're being selfish. Yeah. You're talking about yourself too much or you're not letting the group speak in this mm -hmm. case. Yeah. But yeah, both the nursery and the school and we'll see later the dorms. It's all super communal. Like you mm -hmm. don't really have your own spot very often like you're just sleeping with other people all the time in dorms yeah and even like you're you, you know you were raised with your parents for a little while but then you go start to like sleep in the dorms i thought that was interesting they, they made a point to be like no like psychologists figured out like we need to have kids stay with the parents for like the first few years or they will get fucked up <laughs> mm -hmm. but then like it's more socially acceptable at that point you're you should go to the dorms like mm -hmm. that's Otherwise, you're being kind of antisocial. Yeah, like there's judgment involved if you don't do that. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about, I guess, family structures a little bit. Okay. So Shevik's dad is Pallet, mm -hmm. and his mother's name is Rulog. Later in the book, we talk about how they basically don't use the possessive even when talking about their own parents. Yeah, we'll it's say the father, the mother. Yeah, yeah. But family structures are super loose. You can kind of do whatever. Like after those first few years with the baby, like you just. Get, you could be like, bye. Yeah, you could just bounce and never see them again, which is kind of what Rulog does. <laughs> mm -hmm. Palette ends up being like the actual present father figure for Shevet. Mm -hmm. They're very Rulog. close. Which it's interesting. Shevet kind of gets messed up because of this or yeah. just doesn't take it right. But it seems like a lot of characters, this is what would happen to them. A lot of people on. Uh, Anaris would experience this with no problem. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. Like, yeah, he does. He has some mommy issues for sure. <laughs> yeah. I think they address this really well when it comes to romantic relationships, but they didn't quite nail it with family relationships, hmm. maybe. But at one point, Shavik's love interest says something of like, well, we're choosing to be together. Yeah, we have the freedom to like leave whenever the fuck we want. But yes. the fact that we're still choosing to be together makes it almost more important. And yeah. I like super related to that. Yeah, yeah, I, me too. That's that's. I agree with their take that it makes it more. It's it makes a it more choice. special. Yeah. It's not like damn the old ball and chain you know, or something. <laughs> it's very like found family kind of thing too, because like you see even in their friend group, like they're basically like family at that point, and they, they everyone calls each other Amar, which is like their sibling term, basically brother and sister. Yeah. yeah. Or and, you know, and they. It's said before, I guess they gender it, but I think that that sort of uh, freedom mm -hmm. to choose or not choose a relationship makes a lot of sense given that their child rearing is so communal. Yeah. So like, if you want to be a super involved parent, you can like at various points, like I think Shevik hangs out at the nursery one day just to hang out with his kid, like while she's in school, basically, and just like helps with projects or just like yeah. kind of pokes around and like teaches some physics to some kids. Mm -hmm. Like that is awesome. Like if you want to be involved, you can be involved. If you don't, then you don't have to, like yeah. it's fine. I think, but again, I think the environment holds them back because of the work assignments where you feel obligated to go far away, you do end up separating families. And for some families, they're like, like Rulog was like, I don't care who work comes first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like she's kind of a bitch about it. But for other people like Shevik, that really affects him. So yeah. Yeah. I just think it's only possible though, because of that communal 
child rearing because if you don't have that, if you're in our society, I mean, then, you know, <laughs> your kid dies. Yeah. So you have to, you know, you're free because of your mm-hmm. society's obligations to each other. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. So let's let's get back to school, I guess. Yeah. They learn about prisons one day at school. Oh my gosh! This whole se- this is when I was like, okay, this book is fire. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, they're like, what are they, like 10 or something? Like, they seem pretty young. Yeah. Shabek and his friends learn about prison, and they're like, let's play prison, y'all. Which is obviously what kids will do. Yeah. They're just <laughs> like, we know a little bit about this. Let's do it. We're let's experts. play a game. <laughs> so they decide to shut one of their friends up in this like little, it's like a cellar kind of thing. They kind of build it. Do right? they build it? I, I don't know. I picked it, but they like were, were wedging up stones in this area. Okay, yeah. And then kind of built this little prison. And, uh, lot, you know, one of them agrees to, to, to get locked in there. Yeah, and it's so weird. They talk about, like, how long should we leave him in there? And, like... Till he wants out. Yeah, and then they're like, no, that's not how prison works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, you just have to not tell me. Like, just do it and then come back for me later. And, and like, he agrees to, and so they do it. It's insane. They get, like, guilty. They get, like, mm-hmm. scared about it. And finally decide... Shevek decides we're we're gonna let him out. Like, yeah. Fuck this. I need to be able to live with myself. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, the kid overall seems. I mean, he seems like he was fucked up from it, but like I don't think he wanted to show that. He was like putting on a front. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. He was. He did not have a good time. No, no. I mean, they all kind of came away. It was interesting. They came away from then. They were just like not talking about this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're just like, nope, we never did that. <laughs> So yeah, it was just super interesting to hear in these like kid terms what prison is. Yeah, yeah. They're learning about Uras, mm-hmm. and they watch these movies, and they would like show like side by side, like, like a newsreel. Yeah, it felt very newsreel <laughs> of like look how rich and fancy they are, and then they would show like a dead kid or something. It was very fucked up. Yeah, and I I, I loved their conversation afterwards because there's like, well, how old are these movies? Like, how do we know it's real? Like. They're just kind of questioning, which is totally normal. Yeah. And yeah. I, they've been encouraged to question their whole lives, I'm sure. So So they started kind of talking about like, well, maybe it's actually, yeah, maybe it's actually different. We don't really know what's what's going on there. So at one point, one of the friends, Tyrion, who keeps kind of coming up, mm-hmm. he says this classic little quote, if it was that bad when the settlers left, how has it kept going for 150 years? He's basically like, if it's that bad, it's still going. It can't be terrible. Yeah, people would get rid of capitalism if it was that bad. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) Tyrion. Yeah, and so they're having this conversation, and they're talking about, like, well, you know, it's your nature to be Tyrion. It's my nature to be Shevik sort of thing. Like, Mm -hmm. human nature, very philosophizing for these kids. Yeah, right. And they start talking about, as Odonians, or, you know, as uh, Anaresti people, it's their common nature to be responsible to one another says and that responsibility is our freedom yeah so this topic of freedom keeps coming up and it's so interesting because like i think from especially an american perspective freedom is like i can do whatever the fuck i want yeah and for them their freedom does lie in because i'm part of this community and i'm helping that means i have the ability to choose how i want to help that community i guess yeah if you believe in this responsibility to your fellow person Mm mm-hmm you know, that's what you want to do. Then you get to choose, like you said, choose how to do it. Yeah. You already have kind of an aim of some sort. It's just a matter of, I am then free. And he gets into this later when he's looking at the university kids and saying, like, these guys are free in the sense that they don't have to do anything for anybody, but they, they don't have like a how. They don't like have any sort of direction as to what to do. Yeah. And then you know? they are not free because they are trying to make sure they have enough. Yeah. Yeah. Then Shevik gets his first work assignment, basically. His work posting, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Not assignment. Planting trees. Yeah. And this is kind of where we first butt up against the idea of this work rotation system as being kind of limiting to the individuals on some level. He he doesn't enjoy it. He's like, you know, is this, isn't this immoral to make someone do work that they don't enjoy? Yeah. I'm more suited for physics. Why am I not just allowed to do physics all day? Yeah. I don't know. It's interesting, though, because, like, A, he is allowed. He could just be like, nah, I'd re- okay, yeah. fine, I don't want to do that. But B, like, if this is work that generally people don't want to do, then that sense of responsibility again comes in, right? Like, mm-hmm. we have to rotate this out or... Or no I'm, one does it. <laughs> yeah. 
Or no one does it, or only a few people are kind of condemned to do it. Definitely, yeah. So, I don't, yeah, I can't think of a better solution. Well, I also think that he kind of, I don't know, he's still young at this point. Mm -hmm. He's still kind of just complaining, like, isn't it immoral that I have to do something <laughs> I don't like? Yeah, they do a great job of characterizing him as, like, kind of a shithead sometimes when he's young. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he, and he does eventually kind of come around on this sort of sense of collective satisfaction. Yeah, yeah. Like, For we a did a hard thing, you know? Yeah, I think they get to that nicely. I think that's part of him being a shithead is, is being a little individualistic and being a little like, I don't know, just pushing back against society, which is just what teenagers do. Yeah. And then coming around and realizing like, no, I actually like <clears throat> need my community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. During this work experience, he basically has his first romance. He basically, he tries to ask out this girl and she's like, no, I already have a partner. And he's yeah. like, well, partnership's not very Odonian. <laughs> Again, <laughs> being like kind of a shit, you know, just yeah. being like using this ideology, trying to use it in the personal sense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it is interesting. Like there's, there is discussion throughout the book about like how women relate to Odo's ideas, even though Odo was a woman. Mm -hmm. And so basically there's society like sexuality is super free. You can basically do whatever and whoever you want as long as it's not rape mm -hmm. or like child abuse. Yeah. And even amongst children, it was interesting. They mentioned like children apparently just kind of freely experiment in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Like Shevik tried like both like boys and girls just like gave them a shot. Like yeah. it's very chill. So it was, it was considered fine societally. Like that's just, that's, yeah. that just happens. Yeah. One of my favorite lines from the book later is <laughs> Shevik is trying to swear and they, he says something like swearing is hard in this language because sex isn't something that's seen as bad and they're not ashamed of, of things. So it's just really hard to swear right, and they don't have yeah. religion too. So uh -huh. they're just like, uh, shit <laughs> is all they can say. Yeah. By damn. <laughs> by damn. <laughs> he tries to ask out this girl, it doesn't work. He eventually hooks up with... Another girl. Another girl for a while. Uh, Beshun, I think, was her name. Yeah, that sounds right. And he, <laughs> he ends up in this conversation with this guy. Oh my god, of course. At the truck stop, was it? The guy says, what a man wants is freedom. What a woman wants is property. All women are propertarians. <laughs> it's insane. And Shevik's like, uh, Odo is a woman? <laughs> yeah. He's like, that's a pretty crazy thing to say about like half of people. Yeah, yeah. He straight up says that. And I'm just like, thank you, Shevik. <laughs> Uh, but it is interesting, like, they do talk about that idea, they, they mention it later in the book, too, because women are bearing children, it makes them more likely to view them as property, or, like, to have more possessiveness over both the kids and their partners. Mm. And, I don't know, I think there's there's good pushback to it, like, Shevik's like, no, that 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 is just half the human race, you can't just say that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think, again, like, we see how families are choosing to stay together if they want to, so, yeah, I, I just... I don't think that holds water. <laughs> yeah, same. And 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 Shevik eventually comes to the other side of that argument. So just saying, like, you know, I think men have to learn to be anarchists. Women don't have to learn. Like, it's I guess both are capable of. It's not not necessarily people of any gender would be able to fit into this society. I think. I think so. Yeah. I, I think there is very little sexism on Anaris. Like this is the closest we get to sexism and it's like pretty chill. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Especially once we get to see Boris. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like here women can do any job. Like there is no distinction between what kind of work you can do. No one assumes you can't do something because you're a woman. Like it's very equal, I would say. And it's built into the language. Uh, yeah. They have a discussion here kind of about the language for sex, like copulating. Yeah, um, so they don't say, like, have sex, because, again, you can't have things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they don't say fuck, because that's more like you're doing something to someone else. So for them, copulating... Making them more of an object versus a... Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. yeah. they don't, like, objectify women in that way. It's it's very cooperative. Even their, even their sex is cooperative. Yeah, and uh, that... Pravich is such an interesting, because it's constructed, their language. Yeah, yeah. It has all these, like, we'll get into more of them, but it has all these nuances as to, like, kind of how, almost how you can think or how you're inclined to think about things. Yeah, I, I love the discussions on language because that does have such an influence, especially me, like, coming from a non-binary perspective of, like, there are some languages which are super gendered. Mm -hmm. And even here, like, the their term for brother or sister is just a mar, which is, like, pretty Both. neutral yeah yeah 
So like, I just, I think that's really interesting how they, they realize that their language has limitations and sometimes <laughs> they like supplement it with like raspy language yeah. in there too when they need it. But I just love that as like language shaping society. Yeah. Yeah. Next, Shevet goes back home after his assignment. Uh, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's moved on a little bit. Yeah. He's, he's like, oh, my friends are lame and like, you know, <laughs> he doesn't fit in classic. Yeah. I, do think it's important though there's a passage in here because he kind of realizes that everything is always changing mm -hmm. yeah i guess that's true and it kind of ties into a, kind of a theme of the book and to me it sticks out as like echoing Engels' description of historical materialism Ooh. as being like this process yeah right? yeah that's you, true you can't ever go into the same river twice mm -hmm. you know anybody says you know you can go home again so long as you understand that home is a place where you've never been that it's going to be different that's great yeah you know but that's so true okay he gets he finally gets to work on some fucking physics he has a teacher named midas and she's this really cool physicist and says like okay you're really good you got to go to the big city mm -hmm. to study and here's where she warns him that there's this guy sabul that's going to be his teacher yeah and says that he will be his man. And this is, again, where we talk about the language saying that they don't really have possessive. Mm -hmm. And so it's really unusual for her to say that. So he's like, okay, like, that's, right. that's going to be weird. Sticks out, yeah. Yeah. We'll encounter this guy. He kind of sucks. He fucking so sucks. <laughs> but he, he, he is scheduled, I guess, or applies. I don't know how it works. He, but he gets into the, the institute. To that institute to go, and they, they eventually have a going away party for him. Oh, I love this. This is uh, one of his friends, Tyrion. He performs a beggar man skit, basically. Yeah. He acts like he's like homeless or something, and like he's on Urus, and it's so good. He's just like, give me money, give me money. And he mixes up the word uh, buy. He says bay. He says, like, yeah. I need to bay things. Yeah, I want to bay this, <laughs> bay that. It's so great. Like, there's such a foreign concept to have someone who doesn't <laughs> yeah. have their needs met. And who think, yeah, who thinks that's ridiculous? too like they're all just like oh this is crazy <laughs> yeah and then they have some classic teen conversations very existential shit like what is the nature of suffering and like all this stuff i love this part because teens do i feel like this is just kind of one of our the stages of life mm -hmm. you're, you're kind of self-important yes you know and you you feel like and if you're a teen listening we're not trying to talk down. sorry yeah we no. are we were there too <laughs> absolutely and, this is from our perspective and maybe you're more humble than we were. That's cool if you are. <laughs> uh, but like you have some, you know, what they would call egoizing tendencies, right? <laughs> yes. Um, but I think it's kind of cool because anaresty society seems to kind of channel these into thinking about things like this, philo philosophical questions or the society outward other people rather than just like your own social status or yeah. like possessing things or relationships or competition or whatever. Yeah. You know? it, yeah. It's much less like petty drama and much more like, yeah, you're encouraged to think about existential questions, which like, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the, yeah, you're right. They talk about like preventing suffering and then this concept of like what binds us together. Yeah, like someone's like, oh, I think it's love that binds us together. And Shevik's like, no, it's pain. I'm like, okay, emo kid. Like, I get it, but I well, don't know. He fleshes it out more as, as the book goes on. To me, that kind of stuck out as like the Buddhist conception of like mm. existence is suffering sort of thing. You yeah, know? to me, I, I thought about it like materially kind of because mm -hmm. in their whole society, like they, they use the term mutual aid straight up. And yeah. they're like, mutual aid is there to prevent suffering. And I'm like, that's a great way of looking mm -hmm. at it. Yeah. So to me, it made sense that, yeah, your life is all about preventing suffering. So your life is all about mutual aid. Like it, yeah, it's a nice little sense. package. Yeah. All right. He goes to the big city, Abenae. Here's where we talk more language talk. The word for work in Pravic is the same as the word for play, which is really interesting. I guess it's just the idea that like, you're going to want to, to do this, right? Like you're going to want to contribute. Yeah, this is... Again, some more like straight up Marx. Uh, this is, I mean, he you know, Marx talked about the higher stage of communism, but being when labor becomes life's prime want. Yeah, yeah, and it, it, it's such a flip <laughs> on that human nature question of like, well, people just won't want to work; they'll right. just want to chill all day. And it's like, I think at one point they say it, like, people want to work and they want to do a good job. And yeah. they're like, thank you. <laughs> yes, yeah, like 
And they don't they don't want to work to make money for somebody or something. They mm-hmm. want to like contribute and be a part of something. Absolutely. And just feel fulfilled themselves. Like I can do a thing. Like when it gets from that work project that he didn't want to do, mm-hmm. you know, he looks back on it and they're looking back and they're in, you know, in this kind of inhospitable place or whatever. Mm-hmm. They're like, look what we did. Like, we we accomplished this. There's a big sense of pride. Maybe this is a kind of trivial comparison, but I think about it like, you know, the first day of summer when you're a kid and you're like, oh, hell yeah, I'm going to do nothing the whole (laughs) summer. And then by like a month in, you're like, I'm fucking bored and I hate everything. (laughs) So yeah, like people have a natural inclination to like want to do stuff. Yeah, yeah. I guess I'll start saying Pravic because it makes more sense. Oh, did you I was, say Pravic? I was saying Pravic like it's Slavic or something. Oh, you know, like okay. <laughs> when it ends in I see. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, the same word for work and play mm-hmm. in Pravic. But drudgery is called Klegich. Klegich. So that's like work you really don't want to do, basically, yeah. which I thought was cool. Yeah. And uh, they <laughs> they referred to defense work as <laughs> No one wants Klegich. to do that shit. Because it's boring. There's no defense to do, really, it seems like. <laughs> All right. So he goes to Abenay, which apparently translates to mind in Pravik. I love when he describes the town. Like, mm. I, I feel like I could really see it. And my favorite yeah. part, though, was, especially in comparison to Uras again, is the shops. There's no ads or signs or really anything. It's just like, here's my workshop where I make the thing and I put out samples of the thing. Yeah. <laughs> It's like you're showing off slash saying like, I mean, take this if you want. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's like <clears throat> this really artisan fueled craft fueled society, which I am just super into. <laughs> yeah. And it's very open. There's no like, you know, there's no privacy in that sense, but there's no like property in that sense. There's no locked doors. Mm-hmm. You can just walk wherever you want to go. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah. He goes and gets food at the cafeteria and then goes to his room, which is something he's never had before, his own solo room. Yeah, he thought it was like a mistake. <laughs> and everything yeah. was like, I there's only what happened. He's like, know? Did I did someone already live here? Well, okay, let's talk about privacy in this world, because it's kinda weird. Basically, Shavik kinda likes it, which like that was a mood. <laughs> yeah. I feel like both of us were like kinda relating at that point. Uh-huh. But he's weird for that kinda in his society. Mm-hmm. So sleeping alone is seen as very weird. Like if you have to sleep alone, it's like, well, you fucked up. Like, (laughs) were you an asshole and no one took you in their dorm? You know, Mm, like, yeah, yeah. you're the outcast or strange at least. Mm -hmm. So you can sleep in dorms. Once you're a couple, you basically can get your, your room for being a couple. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, again, if you have a baby, they stay with you for the first few years. Or even if you're just like hooking up with someone, they have like, they have singles rooms. Yeah. Yeah. Just for the night or whatever. And this is interesting. This is kind of the first time time we hear about these sorts of people. But if you're like a privacy nut, you know, you're just like, fuck you guys. I want to go live alone and be a hermit. You can do that. Mm -hmm. Like, that's not a problem, but almost nobody does. Yeah, it's It's you're free to and you can go do it. But yeah, you're really the kooky old man sort of thing, you know? (laughs) Yeah. So there's this quote. But for those who accepted the privilege and obligation of human solidarity, privacy was a value only where it served a function. So Mm -hmm. like things like sex in this case, like, yeah, don't fuck in the streets, please. Like go to your room. (laughs) And then Shevik realizes having his own room, like, oh, this is actually very good for like intellectual work because you can get up in the middle of the night, write something down, like Mm, not disturb anybody. And like, yeah, that is great. Like. I would have a very hard time in in this society unless I had my own like nook of the workshop because I have to be alone, especially to write. Like drawing, I can kind of do, but like writing for me is a very private thing. That I'm like, I need to listen to my my sad playlist and just stare into space for hours. (laughs) Yeah. So you could. So unless you had headphones, you really couldn't do that like communally. You know. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Privacy is subordinate to like the social. Definitely. And they even talk about it later, like letters aren't sealed yeah <laughs> they just go you fold a piece of paper and send it i like the the uh, reasoning behind that mm-hmm. is you can't expect someone to take the time to bother to transport your letter and also say fuck you you can't read it you know i guess i don't know that feel i mean i assume no one reads it sure yeah and and it's on the other hand people could seal them but they just don't they because just it's don't. like well, who am i to ask this person to to transport this and also ask them, don't read it. Like if they, you know, you just kind of leave it up to, it's very trusting. It's very trusting. And they get trusting. into that when it gets to, when it goes to Uras and, and is 
just he's trusting. Yes, him, I know? thought that was super interesting that like he was raised in a society where you assume the best of people. Mm -hmm. And it was so difficult for him to go to a society where like, no, you have to assume everyone's <laughs> going to kill you. And everyone keeps talking about that guy's an asshole. You know that, right? Like he works. <laughs> you know, and and he's like, oh, you seem nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Back to physics. He meets Sabul. This guy fucking sucks. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, Sabul's an asshole. From the beginning, he's like growling. He's just kind of like, just not hey, do this, do that, do this. <laughs> he tells him he has to learn Iotic, which is the language of Uras, to learn their physics, basically, because they're so advanced. And the weird part is he tells him not to tell anybody. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of, I don't know, Shevik's encountering secrets, almost. Like, yeah. He's like, what? <laughs> he doesn't understand the concept. He's like, why? How, why? Why would I not do that? And, <laughs> yeah. and Sabul says, like, you wouldn't give explosives to a child right like that's what these are and i'm like i mean it's physics is it that crazy well it's physics from a capitalist planet you know dirty it, profiteers oh is it the idea that, like they did a good thing so we can't acknowledge that i don't know i guess the physics i think would be out of everyone's reach yeah no one knows it <laughs> that could encounter it so i don't know he's he well we know later that about subul is that he's like super he's possessive he's, he's very possessive he is secretive and stuff mm -hmm. by nature so there's a there's a quote here that i thought was interesting surely freedom lays rather in openness than in secrecy and freedom is always worth the risk what a cutie and that that's uh, it's part of the central tension of freedom versus responsibility or mm -hmm. the relationship between the two not necessarily. yeah because like they'll, they'll get into like well we are free to make certain choices but since we don't do them ever yeah you know are we really free so i don't know it's it's it kind of touches on that maybe yeah and the privacy thing too for sure mm -hmm. long story short here basically sabul his whole deal is he steals other people's ideas <laughs> yeah he's no longer a good physicist basically so he just steals stuff he steals stuff from uras and like translate them and is like look i did it and then he also basically forces shevik to like co-author make, make him yeah a co-author for all of his work which again forces like he doesn't really but it's implied like if you don't do this i'm not going to help you, you know? yeah they have a passage on that in some place where they're bargaining over mm -hmm. it and shevet comes away from it like what the fuck what did we just do <laughs> yeah what just we happened bargained like profiteers yeah you know? and he was like no violence was done but there was a struggle you know yeah. like this is our first encounter of like a real power structure on an heiress and i think that's great that it's in like academia because that is absolutely where that will lie like that's a thing <laughs> yeah yeah and like in this power structure we learn that sabul has basically bribed his way on to having a mail slot on the mm. transport carriers yeah which are just supposed to be for like metals yeah again we're, we're seeing like there's some corruption maybe or some sort of bargaining mm -hmm. going on yeah some sort of uh, behind the scenes yeah kind of machinations and then this is i think further bolstered by the fact that in Abenay, he's going to this cafeteria and he realizes they serve dessert every day here and everywhere else mm -hmm. in the world they only serve dessert like probably once a decade or something mm -hmm. so like he's realizing like oh there's still inequality here there's still like we get some privileges yeah yeah know? it combined with like his kind of looks room and mm -hmm. all that He's starting to realize that there are differences setting in whether intentional or not yeah yeah you know? and i don't think it's necessarily I mean, Sabul is definitely like sure. That's uh, what's the word? M mul not maleficent. That's the lady. Malicious. From malicious. <laughs> it's definitely maleficent from Sleeping Beauty. Yeah. No, <laughs> I don't think it's malicious in in terms of the dessert thing. Like, I think it's just that like, how does that happen? Is it just they're like, well, we'll serve Abene first, and then everyone else gets resources? Like, I don't know. Well, they went into this at some point that like local cuisine can or local mm -hmm. produce can kind of influence that. So they may just have more confectioners there or something. Yeah, because they're located in the slightly slightly more lush area of the mm, planet. Yeah. So maybe they might that's always have it. a local surplus. Yeah. Going on, Shevik gets ill. Yeah, and like I super this feverishy, was... ill, overworking himself. Maybe that's what I thought. Like I kind of describe how he basically just stays in his room all day and works and skips meals and shit. So I think he just stresses himself to sickness. Yeah, I thought this was super weird. I didn't really understand why, but they describe it as young people in particular on an Aeneas or Aeneas. They are like ashamed of being sick. Yeah, that was a weird link between health and morality sort of thing yeah i thought that was shitty 
<laughs> well, I think it was too, but I, I, I can see it as maybe a byproduct of a society based on responsibility to each other. Mm, if I'm sick, I can't be on the work crew. Right. And especially mm. with young people, because, you know, as you get older, it's expected that you'll, you know, your body's going to yeah. get sick more often, but like, I'm young, I should be healthy and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, that's where it's coming. Not to say it's justified, but I think that's where it would be coming from. Yeah. I think that's my question in this book in general is like, what happens to disabled people? Yeah. Like, you no, know, I mean, they should be to... doing some like therapy some societal therapy to figure out like the issue behind that and yeah they should fix that move on yeah they call it an involuntary crime and it's like dude you just were sick it's not a big deal <laughs> just like yeah. it's not a problem if they don't they don't really get into anything about well what, what would someone with you know that mm -hmm. isn't able to do all that what would what would happen to them i'm yeah. sure they would be like fine but you can't imagine that they would fully experience everything. I, I worry because the society is kind of built on like some judgmental, you know, aspects. So like, would those people be judged because they can't work? Like what would happen? Like, I don't know. I, I'm super curious about that. I'm sure they could do something, right? I mean, they could yeah. produce in some way. And this mm -hmm. is a society that adequately values like music and the arts true. and stuff. So they could, you know, but. But we encounter it several times in the books. Like people will talk shit like, oh, that person only works a desk job. They, they never volunteer for, mm, for manual yeah. labor. So I think, and I think too, because there's not a lot of privacy in this world, I think you'd have to be very explicit and open about your disability and be like, look, I cannot do this. And yeah. just like make sure everyone knows basically. And in that case, it's not, I don't know if there would be as much judgment because it's not a choice. It's not. And like, like we said, when Shevik takes those two helpings, he's like, this is what I fucking need. Like, whatever. Yeah. You know, there may be some subconscious, like, eh, they're not working. But I don't think that generally, by the rules of society, they would be judging people like that, you know? Yeah. It's just their work is so linked to their pride. Like, at one point, they talk about how, like, young people especially, and maybe it's just a, a problem with the young people there, but, like, when they do physical labor, they're very proud of it. They're like, look how strong I am. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know how that's going to play out. Like I'm just a weak ass person, but I guess if I grew up there, I'd probably be pretty buff because yeah. everyone works all the time. And you'd be doing it. Yeah. You'd be doing that from a young age. So he gets real sick and in the hospital, he meets Rulog. Rulog. This lady is weird. She comes back in. She's real awkward. She's just like very unemotional, I guess. Yeah. She's very detached. She's just like, for me, the work always came first. Like I, I, and then she kind of spins it and tries to put it on his dad, which I did not like. She was like, I mean, he could have come to stay with me. They just, they didn't have a posting that he liked, so he wouldn't. I'm like, you could have stayed with him. Like, same thing. <laughs> like, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, she leaves. Mm -hmm. and... It's just kind of awkward. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So after this illness, I think Shevik kind of realizes like, okay, I probably shouldn't like be in my room all day alone. <laughs> that was bad. <laughs> not a great one. He overcorrected. Yeah. He basically starts opening up and people are like, yeah, come on in. And he makes friends. He starts going to concerts. And I love this section where they talk about like in their society, there's not a big distinguishing between art and craft. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's a skill that you learn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> An integral one too. It's not like. Fluff. It's not optional. Yeah. yeah. They don't view it as, as extra. There's one quote that says art was not considered as having a place in life but as being a basic technique of life, like I speech. I love that. I love that. It drives me crazy when people are like, oh, you're, you're so talented or like, well, that makes me sound like I'm bragging. But, <laughs> <laughs> but no, like whenever people are like, how do you do that? I'm like, you just fucking do it. Like, I'm I don't know what to tell you. It's it. not a secret. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, what was interesting though, they do distinguish theater as pure art. Mm -hmm. I guess, uh, to me, that's still very much skill. It, it's like you're learning how to elocution and all that, yeah. you know? delivery i don't know if there's it's like an art that doesn't do anything in life aside from entertain if that were the case i would i think i'd feel better about it if it was more of a distinguish between like physical art and like performance art to me that makes more sense because mm. they talk about how like yeah if you're like a painter or whatever you're probably gonna be decorating like public buildings and stuff like that like it's integrated into life or if you're a craftsman artisan whatever yeah but it's weird that music didn't fall into that too well, true, I guess. I mean, you could sing on like a work gang or something. Yes, yeah. They talk about music 
its form of art being art made out of time. So Shavik is very into it. I thought that was cute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that makes sense. I mean, like, the first... Do you, I don't know. I you did piano and stuff, mm-hmm. so you picked this up before I did in terms of reading music. Mm-hmm. I remember some of the earliest lessons were kind of about how to count yeah. the beat and yeah, stuff, and absolutely. like figuring out like okay, well this is divide basically just dividing it up into pieces and stuff. And I mean, yeah, it's just that's what it is. It's time. It's <laughs> math. It's numbers. Yeah, it's a very but, mathy art. <laughs> yeah. Okay, he kind of gets emo here again. <laughs> And he, he feels like even though he's going out to concerts with people, he's like talking to people, he still feels very alone and just mm-hmm. like that's his natural state. I don't know. On some level, I'm like, yeah, I get it. Like, I'm introverted too. Like, it's fine. Yeah. But I, I feel like some of this is just his early 20s talking. Well, he like, got he a little just, angsty. Yeah. He just yeah. feels like he doesn't fit in. It's like, that's fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> he, nothing quite works for him. And he's just frustrated work wise, relationship wise, everything. He's just like, eh, this yeah. is okay. He's just kind of, you know. This, I feel like, is where the pot gets stirred. He meets up with his old friend, Bedap. Yeah. Bedap's cool. Bedap is very cool. And he basically talks to Shevik about, like, hey, you see, like, this is bullshit, right? Like, there's a power <laughs> structure here. Yeah. And Shevik absolutely resists this. He's like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, we don't have laws. We don't have government. What are you talking about? Yeah. And he, he gives him the definition of government, which is the legal use of power to maintain and extend power. And Bedup is like, well, if you replace legal with customary, then that's the power structure here. And he's right. It is all about public opinion to the point where you are constrained, if not legally, then societally by, you know, for what you can do. Yeah. Or, or at least you're allowing yourself to feel constrained enough to where you don't move past that. Because technically, again, you're not, you're not held back. But like he says, custom mm-hmm. is making you hold yourself back. It's an internal law. (laughs) Yeah. So they they kind of discuss that and they discuss a little bit of their past, the big philosophical discussion. And Bedap's like, yeah, that had a big impact on me Mm -hmm. and on some others of us. And like, Uh you know, you may not have realized it, but like that was a big deal. Mm -hmm. You know, we kind of broke through there. He basically talks about just the bureaucracy. It's just kind of exposing that like, yeah. You know, even though PDC postings are only four years, people stay in power longer than that behind the scenes. Yeah. Think about Sabul, like that guy's definitely yeah. pulling some strings. He really emphasizes like there's this fear of change mm-hmm. on on Anaris that, you know, when you combine that with assholes like Sabul, then it's going to cause power structures to appear. Right. Kind of almost a government by majority is what he Oh yeah, that. yeah. He says he says on ORS they have government by the minority. Here we have government by the majority. And it's like, well, obviously one of those is better. Right. But it's still a government. <laughs> and yeah, and he's he's careful to say, you know, and this is one of the big sticking points for Shevik at the time is like, no, it's not a government. And it's like, yes, sure, it's not a government Technically. really. <laughs> but again with the custom thing, it's, there's this quote it says, uh, stability leads to authoritarian impulse. And they kind of mentioned that, like, in the early days, mm-hmm. people were really vigilant about making sure that they weren't accidentally developing power structures. They might, like, coordinate to mm-hmm. do things, but they weren't ordering anyone to do anything. Yeah, yeah. They, they made sure to distinguish between administration and government. Yeah. And, yeah. like, it sounds like maybe they've gotten lazy about that. Yeah, I think that's what it is. They, they have gotten... Not comfortable materially, definitely, but mm-hmm. still comfortable in the structures of their society. They also talk about the education system and how they've gotten to a point where Odo's teachings are so rigid that they're being spouted off like laws. Mm, yeah. So again, even though you're not, they're not laws, you can't get sent to jail for anything, like you will be ostracized if you don't follow those rules. Yeah, yeah. It's again that kind of Social. settling into, you know, and yeah, and socially binding people into choosing freely (laughs) it's such a nuanced thing yeah i don't know i guess it's important and this is again one of the big things of the book is it doesn't matter if you have the choice to rebel i mean you should always have it but if you don't actually ever choose Mm -hmm. to take another path then it didn't do you any good I don't know. I think for me, I, I view it the other way. Again, I go, I love the discussion on marriage because that is, I don't know. I think that sums it up very nicely. Like you can have the choice to do something, but the fact that you don't means that you're choosing something else. When you say no to something, you're saying yes to something else. So you're saying that everyone's saying yes to that government then? I guess. Or that, the, that you know, structure. the PDC, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
to me, I mean, the social pressure thing, I think, adds another element to it, but... Well, maybe that's it, because no one cares if you break up your relationship. You know, mm-hmm. People will be like, so what? People do that yeah. all the time. You face no ostracization there, versus... If, if you don't you, take a work posting. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's different, because so it's material. A, yeah. So that one's a truly free choice, mm-hmm. versus a choice with some serious consequences. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. He tells him about his friend, Tyrion. Basically, Tyrion went crazy. Um, he wrote this play that was could be seen as anti-Odonian. Um, we later got a description of it, and it was, it's like a parody of like an Uras guy comes to Anaris and like tries to buy things, and it's just a dumbass. And, yeah, like, it didn't sound that subversive at really all. It didn't. It, it sounded, sounded funny. kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> and um. And people gave him what's called a public reprimand, which apparently mm. they don't do much nowadays, but it is was used to like keep people in line, like I guess managers, not bosses, PDC people, I imagine, would get these kinds of things. Yeah. Um, basically everyone would talk shit about you in front of you. <laughs> it sounded to me like the old self criticism or speak bitterness campaign thing yeah, that we've definitely. talked about. We'll see a little later. They actually do have criticism sessions Mm -hmm. as well, where they kind of just go out and complain about how things are going or how their (laughs) neighbors are being. But this one seems more directed at like just an individual who's fucked up, you know? Yeah. And he basically kind of lost it. He got paranoid and he, he just assumed everyone hated him. And then it kind of seemed like maybe they did because he was asking for postings for like being a math teacher and he kept getting sent to manual labor over and over again, Yeah, even though he was qualified. So, you know, again, we're kind of exposing this, like, yeah, if you step out of line, you will be punished, not by jail or fines, but with getting shitty jobs. Yeah, yeah, I think that, I think he was probably right there. And he ends up uh, volunteering to go to an asylum. Yeah, the asylum is interesting. So that's where you go if you just, like, cannot cut it, basically. Um, If you murder someone or if you rape someone, it's not like you're going to be sent there. But you should probably go because your neighbors will just, like, beat you up. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's what it comes down to pretty much is eventually people take out their justice in their own way. Yeah, they, they even say it's for, like, chronic work quitters, too, which mm. I thought was interesting. Like, shit, okay. <laughs> yeah, and they talk about that at some point. I think it's Tokfer who's saying, like, no, we don't have, you know unofficial work quitters Mm -hmm. people who would just kind of barely stay on and Mm -hmm. then like leave immediately it was kind of like travel and not everybody kind of got in trouble i guess for being Mm -hmm. a work quitter but yeah so they argue i love this quote and it says he fought bed up every step of the way but he kept coming to argue to do hurt and get hurt to find what he sought and like that is the uh, the leftist onboarding program is you're going to be real upset about it for a very long time <laughs> but you'll keep coming back. Yeah, you're you're it's painful I guess to see the world in a different way. Mhm. You know. He eventually through the through this he kind of he hangs out with Bedup's friends. Hang, yeah, he hangs out with their crowd. So yeah, he starts hanging out with Bedup's friends and he meets a composer named Solace mm-hmm. and Again, he keeps getting posted to music teaching instead of composing. And he's like, why? And it's basically because his stuff is too avant-garde. And so there is kind of some censorship happening. And it's not, again, it's not like intentional censorship, but it it is kind of because music is a cooperative art, you have to have everyone on board to play your stuff. You can't just be a one-man orchestra. So I thought that was an interesting limitation. Yeah, they're kind of, like you said, sort of censoring it and establishing rules i guess or Mm -hmm. conventions uh, for what's okay and what's not yeah so yeah through his conversations with bed up he's realizing like oh shit like things aren't as good as i thought and he's basically realizing like we should do something about it and he says he could not rebel against his society because his society properly conceived was a revolution a permanent one an ongoing process I mean, dude straight up says permanent revolution. <laughs> this is a good book. Yeah. And I think that ties into what we were talking about earlier about constant change, mm-hmm. a constant process. Being and vigilant about not letting power structures come up. Yeah. The rebellion is, in this case, it's not a rebellion, like he says, but it's reaffirming. It's saying that actually, yes, the as he says, as properly conceived, this is a good society. We need to, it's, it's almost, you know, preserving that against mm-hmm. like against society overall like ossifying into a power structure yeah yeah it's kind of a a return to form basically is what we need yeah it's instead of being destructive 
as a revolution. It's a creative revolution. Yes, yes. I, I think that makes Like, we've got some of the bones here. We just got to be more vigilant about it. Yeah. To me, it reminded me of Mao. Mm. Of the kind of talk that undergirded the cultural revolution and stuff, which mm -hmm. had its successes. But the idea being that even when you transition to a, you're working toward a socialist state, you still have classes that are struggling. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You still got to put in the work. And especially if you're in a situation like Anaris where like your environment sucks, like, yeah, you're going to have some inequality just because of the way the planet is laid out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you got to be vigilant that people don't set themselves like Trotsky would say, or in a, in like a, a cast of, mm, of uh, yeah. bureaucrats, mm -hmm. you know, you want to protect against that. Um, this is where he meets his wife. I love yeah. her. Tavker. So yeah, he goes on a trip with his friends and kind of re-meets her. Apparently yeah. he had meet her, met her before. It was embarrassing. But yeah, <laughs> she basically straight up tells him like, hey, I'm kind of done fucking around. Like, I want a partnership, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Makes it clear. And he's just like, whoa. Yeah, I'm also there. <laughs> yeah. And again, like they're choosing this. It's not an obligation in any way. It's not legal. They literally just come down from the mountains and like, all right, let's sign up for a double room. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> and then of course, you know, they had to plan the wedding and everything. No, they just like... <laughs> Signed up for a double room. Now, yeah. There you go. They get a new room. I think they buy like a new suit just or they don't buy one. They just go get a new suit. Yeah. And um, I think it's really cute. Like the friends are really supportive and give them gifts and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's just nice. It's sweet. Yeah. Um, less sweet. Sabul, his fuckery. Oh, this guy. <laughs> he won't publish uh, Shevik's like seminal work, The Principles of Simultaneity. And he basically can't form his own syndicate because paper is being rationed right now. Mm -hmm. My question here was, I guess we don't have internet yet. No, we don't. I mean, <laughs> I think again, published in 1974. Yeah, we just weren't there yet. <laughs> all we saw of this society anyway, they print, and on URAS is they print everything. I mean, they mm -hmm. have newspapers, they have radio. They have computers, but it's more for like administrative like work. Like a 1960 style computer. I think so, thing. yeah. So yeah, Sabul basically bullies him into publishing a very edited down watered down version and mm -hmm. he's also a fucking co-author you yeah. know didn't do anything jackass yeah <laughs> um they have a baby and little sadiq sadiq oh they this is where they talk about the computer oh yeah so people are named by computer on this planet they yep. just put random words or letters together i think it's five and six letter words mm-hmm and you just get assigned a name. <laughs> you can reuse it so you don't run out of names. Yeah, because Shevik was named, like, apparently he shared a name with someone who, like, built something. I don't remember. As long as they're dead, yeah. it's fine. <laughs> it's crazy. It's like instead of your social security number, you have a name. Yeah. It's interesting. I still like naming things, so I don't know. That's a little weird. <laughs> well, I wouldn't be into it. It gets away from possessiveness. I guess that's true. You yeah. Know, this is not your child. This is everyone's. I guess, yeah, that's a good point. Because then, yeah, you'd be like, well, this person is, you know, a junior or stuff like that. That's mm -hmm. obviously very possessive. And, Egoist. <laughs> mm -hmm. and I can make a good nickname out of almost anything. So, so a drought hits. Mm, this is a big, yeah. This is where shit breaks bad. <laughs> yeah. This is where we really see the limitations of this world. <laughs> At first, people are like, you know what? Fuck yeah, solidarity. We're all going to pull through this together. Everyone's very optimistic about it. Shevik gets an emergency farm posting to, like, try to go plant some crops and then um you know he's separated you know he has to go to a different area of the planet for a while yeah but it gets it just keeps getting worse and worse yeah they they just have like a just a missed connections repeatedly oh you know? no yeah they're trying to send letters and then she gets posted somewhere else mm -hmm. and oh. meanwhile the drought's just like it's horrible. continuing <laughs> yeah people are starving and yeah it's rough so he's coming back to Abenay. Um, he's taking a train uh, back to his family and they get stuck on the rails like overnight and the town uh, won't share their food. Mm -hmm. And this is the first, they're really conflicted about this because like, well, it's not their food. Like what the yeah. fuck? They're being proprietarians. And people think like, what if we go take, take the food? And they have a big discussion kind of openly about this. I thought it was decide super interesting. Not to. Yeah, they're like, okay. Because the thing is, like, they would normally share it, even if, like, that meant everyone only got a little bit. But they're just straight up wasn't enough. Like, there were yeah. too many people on the train. There were too many people on the train, too small of a town to, like, ever be able to feed that many people. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know if the next train was really going to come in with food. So it was a rough spot for everybody. I was like... There's no good. I mean, mm -hmm. that sucks. There's not a good solution here. And yeah. I think that's really what the drought shows us is that this 
society is pretty fragile. Mm-hmm. Like if something goes wrong, you're you're fucked. People are reverting to these like, well, this is my food, which is understandable. Like you're fucking hungry. Yeah, I think it's interesting though that this is Shevik's first experience with hunger, with mm-hmm. going out. And I think that's nice because, uh, you know, there's like two jokes on the right wing, <laughs> and that's there are only two genders, and <laughs> communism equals starving. And every time you say there's only two genders, we add another gender. <laughs> it's true. And so this was just a good, like, middle finger to... Yeah, absolutely. You know, like, like, this guy, maybe they don't have a lot here. It's kind of Spartan, but they always is. eat. It is, absolutely. Know? There's always two meals a day, no matter what. And he's really shaken by this. Yeah. Um, he gets home, and his freaking family has gone. Uh, Tavker got reassigned somewhere else, and she's like, there's a famine. I feel like I don't have a choice. Again, I feel like I don't have a choice. She did, but she left. I have just been notified it is Tokver, not Tavker. I just remember that he calls her talk at some point. I, yeah, and I was right. like, wait, but that only makes sense if it's Tokver. Okay, it's Tokver. <laughs> Sorry, I apparently switched uh, those letters. No, I, I was convinced I read it wrong. So. <laughs> I just like how Tavker sounds better. I, me and that good. computer are going to be yeah. fighting. <laughs> Um, I was about to say, do they name your cats, but you don't have to have pets, so. So, yeah, just notes for sad. ourselves, things to change is, like, maybe uh, maybe you give people, like, a list of three names. <laughs> oh, yeah, that'd be nice, <laughs> yeah. And I would like cats, please. Yes, obviously. Um, so, yeah, they they left town, and Shavak basically doesn't have a job. Yeah, he goes to the <laughs> Institute, and they're like, uh... We tried to make sure you weren't fired, but you were fired. Sorry, bro. Yeah, like, we don't super need temporal physics right now. We're kind of, like, in a drought. So he takes a post as a work coordinator. Yeah, yeah. There's a little There's a time cut. jump, and he's, like, riding on on this truck back to his family. Mm-hmm. He's done with the work assignment and everything, and the drought's sort of, like... It's eased up. Yeah. I, we've talked about relationships a lot, but I, just, I love this theme in the book, so I'm going to talk about it again. <laughs> They talk about how relationships are always changing, and Mm -hmm. that's what's exciting. And I love that. That's such a good view on long-term relationships. And again, like, larger structurally makes sense with the theme of, like, yeah, everything's changing. Yes, yeah. And I love the truck driver guy. He was cool. He was very cool. Um, They talk about, like, basically how shitty it was during the drought. Like, Shevik was a work coordinator, which meant at some point he basically had to decide who gets to live. Because... If you don't work, you get like half rations because you don't need as much protein. But if you get half rations and you're already in a drought, you basically get sick and it's really hard to get better. Yeah. Or if you're already sick and that's why you can't work, then you're getting half rations. And, yeah. You know. And they're just like, no one should have to make those kinds of decisions. Yeah. Yeah. He reunites with his family. His daughter's four. So he like kind of has to re-meet her. That's yeah. fucked up. Yeah. And yeah, he gets to reunite with his wife or with his partner rather. And um, they talk about Tyrion again. Tyrion, who was already crazy by our society's standards, he says, because he was an artist. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> they call him an artist, creator, inventor, destroyer, and then end up calling him a satirist, which I'm like, yeah, that's what he... I, I think, is it just because the society is so built on public opinion that you're not kind of allowed to speak badly about it? I don't know. I was just taking it as a comment on what art does. Like, yeah, if your art is just like, things are great, Mm -hmm. especially if you're in satire. I mean, like, obviously not everything has to be a social commentary. Yeah. Yeah. But if it's satirical in any sort of way, it'd be pretty boring satire if it was just like. (laughs) It's And it was good. And it kept being good. Yeah. I struggled with that because I'm just like, he didn't have to go crazy. (laughs) Like, I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't think he was genuinely saying he is crazy because of that yeah he's just saying that our society sees people like that as crazy Mm, okay gotcha. he's 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 already like almost completely on board with bed app at this point yeah yeah you know yeah and they basically decide you know clearly there's some power structures here no one said no to their work postings during the drought Mm -hmm. so like let's start our own printing syndicate yeah classic gotta start an underground printer to be revolutionary (laughs) yeah it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier about like seeing this as a returning to form Mm -hmm. regarding Odonianism rather than like a rejection of it. Right. We're not breaking away and doing something. We're not saying let's introduce some capitalism or something. (laughs) Right. But it's permanent revolution again. Yeah. We're we're changing. It's the river you can't stand in. You see, he kind of mentions this about Odo saying for Odo, 
you know, there wasn't a means and an ends, but there was the process. The process, yeah. There's a whole thing. I like it's that. historical materialism. Again. Yeah. All right. They start their syndicate and they start some shit. They basically, to me, it's kind of like they're shit posting, <laughs> <laughs> but in public, which well, they, is terrifying. They start radioing uh, Uras, right? Mm hmm. They start basically talking to them. And a lot of this, again, I, I call it shit posting because. To me, a lot of this is like, what can we get away with? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they're radioing Uros, and eventually they're like, what if we let an, or, uh, some Odonians from Uros come here? And everyone at this like public meeting is like, fuck you. Yeah, no you way. cannot do it. It's funny, though, like the radio stuff, they did it, but I, I like to think they went beforehand. They went to the council people, and they were mm -hmm. like, what if we do this? And they were all like, no way. No, fuck you. But they just did it. Like, <laughs> yeah, they just are doing shit because they literally, because they can. Yeah. And so finally, they're, yeah, they're like, well, what if we bring people here? No, definitely no, not. No, they're like, I'll fucking kill them. I hate them. Um, Rulog is there, Shavik's mom, and she's like, oh, this is stupid. And then they're like, well, fine. What if we send one of our guys over there? And they, of course, don't like that plan either. It's a little <laughs> bit more split, though, I think, that one is. Yeah. It, what's funny to me, they bring up the original agreement, which is no Urosti can come here. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, he wouldn't be an Arasti because he's from Anaris, so he'd be an Anaresti. And I'm like, that's a rule, guys. You see this. It's not a law law, but it is a rule. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you get the point, right? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So yeah, they propose sending Shevek, and at first everyone's like, yeah, we're not actually going to do it. And then it seems like they're going to do it. Yeah, it's basically left out what that resolution is. We jump forward then to mm -hmm. him actually leaving. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> However they figure it out. <laughs> Uh, Shevet gets on the ship to Uras. There's a bunch of protesters there. Yep. Yelling and screaming. Throwing, I think they throw a rock at him or something. I think, yeah. does. He freaks the fuck out, which, you know, space travel. Probably freaky. <laughs> Understandable. Yeah. Um, they have a doctor on board who gives them a bunch of vaccines because, like, hey, like, your planet's been isolated for hundreds of years. You do not have any of these. Yeah. And <laughs> he's very confused at that point. <laughs> he's so confused. They throw away his, uh, like a, his clothes that he was wearing at one point, and he's like, throw, throw it away. Why would you do that? Like, he's that's very clothes. wasteful. Yeah. <laughs> and he just starts having these discussions with the doctor. And keep in mind, this for readers is chapter one. So, <laughs> mm, yeah, this is why it's, it's really confusing starting out. Yes. You know, the doctor's asking questions like, okay, you guys don't have religion. You guys, like, treat women the same. What the fuck? <laughs> you know, Shavik is just, like, kind of making the doctor question things a lot, you know. Bothering him. Mm -hmm. They get to Uras. It's kind of fantastic looking to him. Yeah. He's like, wow. He sees an animal on the way, and he's like, holy shit, an animal. <laughs> it's a donkey. You know, he gets his own private quarters, and they're super lush. Um, he's amazed at the bathroom. He's like, all this for shitting? <laughs> yeah, it's this, uh, yeah, this whole, like, temple to <laughs> shitting. But he gets real clean there. He doesn't know what to do. There's, like, a servant, and he's like, are you my roommate? Like, <laughs> he does not understand. Also, yeah. this is a second language, so he's, like, speaking kind of brokenly. Mm -hmm. um, and then we meet some physicists. By the way, uh, writing my notes, I kept forgetting the word physicist, and I kept accidentally being like, Phys physician? Phys Physicians. Phys 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 <laughs> I could not remember it. <laughs> um, we got Dr. Chifoilisk. He's like this grumpy dude from Thu, which if you remember is like basically their socialist country. Yeah. Dr. Oye. He ends up being Shavik's friend after mm -hmm. a while. Yeah. Dr. Atro is an older guy who Shevik has actually been writing to physics stuff beforehand. Yeah, he ends up, you know, we'll, we'll see more of him. He's, a he's, a, he's an imperialist. Yeah. He absolutely is an imperialist. And then Dr. Pei is another physicist. He's, he's a government nice, guy. But, yeah. And Shevik is pretty excited to, like, finally be talking to people who are on his level about physics. He's like, oh my gosh, this is what it's like to have friends. <laughs> yeah, and that's why they had encouraged, you know, him his communications with them and everything initially. Mm -hmm. was because they didn't have this sort of physics where you know, on Anaris. You know? Yeah, they weren't interested in it. At one mm. point, he's like, hey, uh, where are all the women? And everyone's like, what? <laughs> well, at first, they're also like, oh. Oh, do you um, want a prostitute? Yeah, we can find you some women. <laughs> Tell us what you want. And he's like, whoa, uh, no. <laughs> yeah, um, basically, this is a super gendered society, super sexist. They... You know, are incredulous that women do the same work as men on Anaris, and they're just like, um, they just don't have the head for figures. What are you talking about? Yeah, they can't do science. And he's <laughs> like, they, they're like, you let them do science? You know, there can't be many in 
that field, right? And he's like, well, about, about half. half. <laughs> I love Shevet. He's so chill. <laughs> uh, they had this one line that I thought stuck out. They 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 say a beautiful virtue. So one of them, I think, Pay. Yeah, he says pay. a beautiful virtuous woman is an inspiration to us, the most precious thing on earth. And apparently, it, it like creeps Shevek out, and it is a creepy thing to it's say. It's a super creepy thing to say. <laughs> like why? Why it's are like you so this weird? Handmaid's Tale sort of like. It's, it's very yeah. They show them the fucking town, man. They show them everything. You, well. Almost. Everything they want them to see. <laughs> Good point. You know, they're driving around in the car, which apparently is very luxe because environmental laws mean, like, cars are super taxed. Mm -hmm. um, and they think this is, like, the height of humanity that they've done this. Yeah, they're know? like, oh, yeah, we're not, like, we're taking care of our environment now. Yeah. Look how good we are. And it's like, okay, <laughs> sure. They do a lot of sightseeing. They go to, like, country villages and museums and all these things. And he's kind of shocked because he's like, he has grown up on this education of like, no, this is a really shitty place. Everyone's, you know, suffering. And he, he doesn't see that. Yeah. He sees everyone well-dressed, well-fed. And I like this, that he had, had kind of assumed like our opposite. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. He assumed, you know, the quote is, he assumed that if you removed a human being's natural incentive to work, his initiative, spontaneity, uh, creative energy and replaced it with external motivation and coercion he had become lazy and careless as a worker i mean yeah it it is the <laughs> what if people don't want to work question just flipped on its head in reverse yeah what if they're not working for their own internal values and it's just great to <laughs> <Yeah>. see <laughs> he can't conceive of profit as a motivator and i'm like wow what a world yes literally <laughs> And he tries to talk with, like, regular people, and every time his guides are like, oh, we gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they basically show him a bunch of things. He tours, like, a space center, and he figures out, oh, you guys want my physics because you want faster than light travel. Yeah, I think like, the guy there just straight up tells him, mm -hmm. hey, glad you're here to help us do the faster than light travel <laughs> yeah. thing. He basically, he's starting to really like this planet in terms of, like, wow, this is super lush, that they're so advanced, all this stuff. And he feels like he doesn't fit in on either planet and just is like, ooh, I think he feels bad that he likes it this much. Mm -hmm. And he feels bad for his home world because they don't have as much. Yeah. At one point, he's like, why do they get the nice planet? Like, they didn't deserve it. And he's like, whoa, who says anything Stop about it. deserving? That's yeah. shitty. <laughs> yeah, I like that. He, he starts his teaching post and kind of figures out how education is different on Uras mm -hmm. compared to Anaris. We mentioned Anaris already, but on Uras, it's, I mean, think more like our it's situation, more traditional. right? Like, it's... Students going to, to university, like, full-time. Mm -hmm. And he's, um, like, kind of amazed. He's like, wow, no one here is falling asleep because they were on work duty last night. Yeah. Like, this is kind of nice. But it's also bad. Like, he, he tries to not give grades, and everyone's pissed at him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he's like, fine, I'll give you grades. They're all A's. You know? <laughs> and they're like, it's not fair. Right. They complain about it, and he's, in, like you said, kind of impressed while mm -hmm. they're doing so well. But he's also, like sorry for them in a way yeah um, he's like sad that they are not internally motivated again yeah like this is a means to an end for him uh, you're just here to get a piece of paper right. <laughs> that's what he's realizing he, at some point with the grades thing mm -hmm. they're like well why shouldn't someone just not do the work and get the grade and he's like well of course if you do, don't want to do the work you should not do it <laughs> that's <laughs> and he, amazing and he's just like you should be here to want to do it if yeah, you don't you that's on you like, yeah i don't know it's it's a cool way to look at it. Yeah, again, it's that freedom from and freedom to. Mm -hmm. At one point, he tries to get someone to explain economics, but, <laughs> quote, it was like listening to somebody in interminably recounting a long and stupid dream. <laughs> Honestly, reading economics is Anyone like, who's done that, yeah, <laughs> it sucks. Uh, and I imagine, as, you know, sure, we're, uh, we, we talk about Marx and stuff on the show. We, we talk economics, but capitalist ones yeah. where they're trying to justify human suffering it's pretty rough yeah yep mm. oh i love his shopping trip the shopping trip this he, is like me going shopping. <laughs> i was thinking about you like gray's gonna love this page <laughs> so he t is taken basically i guess like downtown to get some clothes and he is freaked the fuck out they go like a whole page is just listing objects yeah <laughs> he's like why is there so much stuff why is it so expensive too yeah he asks about like a fur coat and he's like that could feed a whole family here i think like yeah and he's also super confused like 
where are the people who make the things? Mm -hmm. And he says, no one, they had no relation to the things, but that of possession. So like, we don't see where any of these objects are made, which I thought was really interesting, especially compared to his world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all about consumption. You don't care how it was produced, what happened to the person producing it, any mm -hmm. of that. The resources, the pollution. None nothing. of it. It's all hidden away. Yep. He has a conversation with Dr. Chifoilisk, and they, I thought, had a great conversation about kind of the differences between capitalism and socialism and and anarchism yeah yeah chifoilisk comes from thu which is a very highly controlled state super centralized yeah and at one point he's like well you know we're paying people what they deserve and mm -hmm. that's that's right you should still do that and um Shevet just goes well how do how do you decide what he deserves does he just decide what he deserves yeah yeah <laughs> So I guess to clarify, like Thu seems like this, mm, it's a state socialism mm -hmm. sort of model, right? Yeah. The lower form of communism from each according to their ability to each according to their contribution. Yes. Right. Uh, and then, yeah, the, the important question raised there is, well, who decides the value of that? And yeah. I think that's, you know, Shevet kind of, he mentions that he sees Thu as kind of half a revolution. I liked that term yeah. a lot. That was helpful. You did some of it, but you, and I think it's, mm, to me, that's interesting because like, I think the Thuvians and the Anaresti both can arrive at communism eventually. Yeah. They might just be different roads. If I get, I mean, that re requires Thu to like change eventually. Yes. And Anaris to change, but I mean. But Anaris's change is more material of like, we got to get better at producing things and eventually we can be more chill. Mm -hmm. And theirs is, we have to be more chill. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's like, is one better or worse? Or is it like maybe better for different circumstances? I mean, I think, and we'll get into the foreign policy section here in a minute. I think under this context, it makes more sense for Thu to be socialist because got of their an neighbors. enemy right nearby. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that might make more sense. <laughs> yeah. Basically, Chifoilisk is like, hey, you're defo being bugged here. Like, you're, <laughs> you should watch out. These people definitely want shit from you. And, um, you know, mysteriously, the next day, he is gone. <laughs> yep. Who knows how that happened? Mm, I don't know. Another conversation that we see with Shevek is with Atro. This guy sucks. <laughs> <laughs> he has a few conversations with him and he likes him as a physicist and maybe kind of as a person, really. Yeah, that is, uh, I think, a great distinction because a lot of these men like Shevek, but they're like, they don't know how to reconcile his planet with how much they like him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And kind of vice versa. Like, mm -hmm. he, he agrees, you know, he, he likes Atro, mm -hmm. but is like, you're fucked up in some ways. Because <laughs> uh, Atro is all about like survival of the fittest and, mm -hmm. he, and he he wants to dominate the other systems so i just thought that was an interesting conversation and later they'll talk about foreign policy too mm -hmm. and he's just like what it's it's let's, just what you let's do go conquer yeah <laughs> after that Cheve gets tired of going to all these functions i think this is kind of cool because he just says fuck it i'll start preaching anarchism to people basically <laughs> And, and he does, and they just kind of all like smile and nod, and they're like, mm, "How true?" Yeah, I love that they they basically are like listening without actually listening. <laughs> yeah, it's because he's like, "No one's censoring me. This is weird," but they don't need to because mm -hmm. no, they're because they're tuned out. They're not paying attention. <laughs> he goes to Oye's for dinner, and I liked this. He realizes that this guy, who is kind of like shy and stuff in public, is much more free at home. He, he seems much nicer, much more brotherly and just friendly. The kids are fascinated by this guy from the moon, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, he's explaining some like really basic things. He's like, oh, you can't have, you know, Oye at one point asks for a classic question, like, what about murder and robbery? <laughs> Wouldn't everyone murder everyone? <laughs> he's like, well, you can't rob because no one owns things. So you can just take stuff. Yeah. And he's like, um, would you normally murder me? Right. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> are you just really into murder? Also, if you were, if you had decided, yeah, I would murder you, would a law stop you? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I love that point. It's like, if you're, if you've made up your mind to murder someone, like, I don't think me saying no is going to stop. He says coercion is the least efficient means of obtaining order. Oh, delicious. The anarchist creed there. Delicious. <laughs> Oh, also, the kid has a fucking pet otter. I'm so jealous. He has a land otter. <laughs> yeah, a that looks so cool. That sounds uh, so cute. It also sounds kind of scary. I don't know. What if it bites you? 
That's fine. He gets an anonymous note. In his coat, right? In coat pocket? coat pocket, yeah. And basically, he assumes it's from some Odonians who are just like, hey, join us. Like, yeah. why Quit are you working? Quit working with the assholes. Yeah. <laughs> so you kind of realize it's like, okay, yeah, they're definitely purposefully keeping me isolated from poor people. Mm -hmm. I should probably try to talk to one. So he awkwardly tries to talk to his servant and it's just like, hey, you're poor. What's up? Yeah. And of course, the servant does not take Tell that Tell me well. the real poor life. And he's <laughs> yeah. just like, uh. Uh, no thanks. <laughs> yeah. And um, then this is where he meets Vey, who mm -hmm. I have a lot of feelings about Vey. <laughs> Vey's a character. Oh my gosh. So she is Oye's sister-in-law. She's just like this very delicate, proper lady. She's definitely putting this on as a front though. You know, like she is, she is working within the system. <laughs> Let she, me just say that. She read to me like uh, the archetype of like the flapper girl sort of. Ooh, like yeah, I could see 20s that. 20s kind of party, yeah. high class socialite sort of thing. I could see that. Definitely socialite. You know, Shavik's like, wow, she's super hot. He's drawn to how delicate she is and how she like kind of acts dumb and shit. And I'm just like, why are you? That's what confused me is I'm like, why are you into this? You have never, is it just because it's different and he's never encountered a woman who acts like this? Or Probably. is it, I guess it just made it seem like he had this natural draw to it that I'm like, that's a little icky for me. It could have just been very exotic or something to him. Sort maybe. of strange, a different thing that he was like, maybe I also like this, you know? Maybe. Yeah. I just, I guess I just didn't enjoy that characterization of like, oh, this is obviously attractive to every man. <laughs> oh no. And I don't think it, you know, she didn't. It wasn't like there were hordes of men like tripping yeah. over themselves around her, really. I was just surprised. I was surprised he was into that. Yeah. I mean, everybody's got different tastes. I, I guess. guess, yeah. This is where we learn about the uprising in Bimbilly. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which kind of stands in for like our kind of global south or third world mm -hmm. sort of thing. So they have a dictator and some rebels have thrown him out and they open the prisons and Shevik is really pumped about this. And so he starts like listening to all the news bulletins like, hey, maybe there's some hope for this fucking planet. I did wonder to myself who put the dictator of Ben Billy into power. <laughs> and yeah, I, I'm willing to bet it was AIO. <laughs> the Iodans yeah. and the Thuvians send troops. Like fucking shocking. Yeah. At one point... Oye and Shevik are talking and he's trying to explain like, well, you guys don't have other countries on your planet. So like you wouldn't be so anarchist if you, if you had to deal with that. Which is what we're talking about with Thuvians. With Thu, so, yeah. Uh, but yeah, they have that conversation. Oye says it's, just, you know, I mean, it's like, it's the law. It's, you know, mm -hmm. it's just like, uh, like gravity and Shevik just he goes, destroys him. It's so mad. And oh yeah, it's just like devastated. He's just like he's, oh, he likes Shevik. Yeah, I think he's he's get he's going on that struggle journey that Shevik did. Yeah, yeah. He ends up going to a, I guess another big city on this in this country, Neo Essaya. Neo Essaya, that's the biggest city. I think so. Yeah. And the university's like on its outs, you know, not its oh, outskirts, okay. but like it's a different city, a college town nearby. <laughs> yeah. Okay. He gets freaked out, basically. He's like, wow, everyone's walking around like very hustle culture. Everyone looks worried. I like this. Was it because no matter how much money they had, they always had to worry about making more lest they die poor? Mm, or yeah. was it guilt? Because no matter how little money they had, there was always somebody who had less. Damn. I ain't that the way. It's probably the first one. I mean, probably, for most, most people, people. It's my own struggle is hard. Oh, I love it. He goes to an art gallery and is like really pissed at how expensive it is. He goes like, a man makes art because he has to. Why was that made? <laughs> <laughs> and he almost, he, he gets kicked out. He doesn't, yeah, he doesn't get like commercial, the commercialization of art. Yeah, it's, it's just like, like a foreign concept. <laughs> yeah. And then he calls Vey, and this is where it goes downhill for me, at least. <laughs> they hang out. He thinks of the term that his wife or that his partner uses, uh, which is body profiteer. Mm -hmm. uh, someone who used their sexuality as a weapon in a, in a power struggle with men. I thought this was a weird, I guess, second wave feminism kind of idea of like, let's judge slutty people. Mm, okay. <laughs> I didn't super appreciate that. I'm like, man, if you want to be slutty, be slutty. That's not the problem. And yeah. like, clearly they don't have sex. They don't have shame around sex. Who? The NRS D. The Rorosti yeah. do for sure. Yeah. But okay. I yeah. thought that was weird that they still have kind of a term. Basically, body profiteer is like a term for like a whore. I'd, well, it wouldn't be commercially. No, I, I guess I mean like whore, like socially. For power, which, yeah, I don't know. I, 
I guess it's, to me, it's still right as slut shamey. Yeah. I could. Which like, don't get me wrong. I fucking hate Vey. I think she sucks. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I was but just trying to why. understand if maybe from their point of view, they were focusing on more like it's shitty. Well, no, cause they are distinguishing the way. Cause it's shitty to try to get into a power struggle in the first place. Mm -hmm. So then why do you distinguish that it's shittier to do it with your body? Yeah. I thought that was weird. Okay. Fair enough. But it's the seventies. Yeah, it is the seventies. <laughs> so I get it. And, but that being said, I do hate Vey. <laughs> She's like, She's kind of bought into the system and it's like, oh no, I still have power because I can make men do what I want because like I'm sexy. What is it? The woman is <laughs> the, the woman neck. is the neck of the family <laughs> if you've watched the Greek wedding. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and she then gets into like one of the more annoying things about capitalist defenders is like, oh, you guys would, you know, you guys just wish really you had these nice things. Yeah, she's like, you know? oh, if you brought one of your, your sisters from your planet, they would totally love this. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, people like pampering, but that's not the point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They go to a museum and Shevet gets freaked out because there's this like horrible cloak that's supposedly made out of like the skin of rebels flayed alive. Fucked up. <laughs> and they, oh my God, this quote, but it's all just history. Things like that couldn't happen now. <laughs> oh my God, dumb fuck. Yeah. She sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and then they throws a party and she's very flirty with Shevik the whole time. Mm -hmm. She's saying like, you know, your laws are in your heads. So you threw out the laws, you threw out the tradition, religion, but you still say no to things, which is true. Like we've yeah. seen that and we've talked about that, but the way she's viewing it is then like, well then fuck it. Like do whatever you want. Like, I don't, I just want to be free. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. She's like the grossest kind of oversimplification of egoist anarchism, sort mm -hmm. of like fuck off. It's all about me. Yeah. I do what I want. Yeah. It's nihilistic. Yeah. Right? She says, I don't care about other people and no one else either. They pretend to. I don't want to pretend. And I'm just like, fuck you. You suck. She's just an edgy teen, basically, in terms she of is. that. And I mean, again, teens, you guys are not Sorry. all this way. Sorry, teens. But this is, uh, this people can do this and it's, it's kind of a mistake. Yeah. She's going too far the other way. It was like, you're, you're not free because you care about people. I'm like, no. It, right. Again, it's that responsibility to others that mm -hmm. I think everyone should have some of that. Yeah. They have a party. It sucks. Um, this businessman tries to mansplain physics to Shevik. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's like, no, you don't understand. It's like, dude, you've read like what? One physics book probably that I wrote. Like, <laughs> um, Shevik is like getting mad about the war and he's like, you know, this is people killing each other. It's not just names of countries. And then someone's like, well, that's what soldiers are for. It's psychotic. And I love this quote. He knew what he wanted to say and knew it must convince everyone because it was clear and true, but somehow he could not get it said properly. And like, we've all been there, man. Yeah. We've all had too many drinks at a party trying to explain why communism is good. And he, I felt <laughs> bad for him because like he had like, I don't know if people didn't explain to him or what, because he's just like guzzling these down. He does not understand alcohol. <laughs> yeah. I guess he had the first one. I was like, what? I was fine. Uh, yeah. They will not have an effect at all. I just kept doing he it. He gets very drunk. Yeah. I like this line though. He says he basically calls them possessed by their possessions. This is his big dramatic speech, you mm -hmm. know, uh, say goodbye, you know, say goodnight to the bad guy sort of thing. <laughs> and then he fucking sexually assaults Faye, which sucks. Yeah. You know, that scene happens. So now, was, trigger warning for this book. I was trying to think of, uh, why does, why is this included? Yeah. I guess, is it just to show that he's like not perfect? Well, there's a few ideas kicking around one i thought initially and kind of think it does a good job of just kind of like well this is he's a narratively maybe he's like reaching rock bottom okay this yeah. is like the worst thing one of the few really truly everyone will fucking hate you for things to do mm -hmm. on his planet mm -hmm. you know and he's gone down into the you know into the depths of immorality here mm -hmm. to to do that there's another idea is like that maybe it's sort of like because right before that, he's guzzling all these drinks mm -hmm. that he doesn't truly want. He's thirsty, but he's drinking this. Mm -hmm. He's eating snacks that he even says, like, I don't really even want this. But yeah. I'm just, like, cramming it down. It's like he's just, like, taking and consuming. Just indulging. Even in the ways that he doesn't believe in, like, consuming a person. Interesting. You know? Okay. Which, and I get, you're also right that, like, it proves that he's not perfect. He isn't the guy, you know, the guy that has the right ideas because he's always good. Maybe, yeah, I can see that. And it definitely does illustrate that, like, yeah, this guy, this capitalist culture has consumed him at that point because he is consuming everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that makes sense. It does, it sucks to read, by the way. So, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, he gets taken home and... Because he just throws up and passes out. Yeah, they're just like, all right, we'll drop him the fuck off. He basically gets back to work. He's hungover. He has to figure out what's going on next, what he's going to do. He's basically climbing out of a hole he's dug, you know? Mm-hmm. He finds out about the Ansible. Yeah, okay. So I thought this was fun. <laughs> so we had, we had read the Ender's Game series kind of growing up. And mm-hmm. so I was like, oh, Ansible's back. Okay. I yeah. guess I think it was a common theme in, in these books. I want to say this is maybe the origin of it. Really? Um, so not actually in this book, mm-hmm. but in a previous work by Le Guin. She came up with the Ansible? Yeah. Holy shit. Uh, it was coined in her 1966 novel, Rokinen's World. Okay. All right. So, by the way, an Ansible <laughs> is basically faster than light communication. So not necessarily travel, but just a communication device. Instant, yeah. Instant communication. He finds out about this and pays just like, get the fuck to work. Like <laughs> You should do really work. do this. And, and he's just like, fine, I'll fucking do it. Yeah. Well, he was just kind of making breakthroughs. And he does m- basically make his breakthrough in that mm-hmm. passage. This is where then he has an actual honest, like, frank conversation with his servant, E4. E4, I love E4. So he, he tells him about all these, like, terrible shit. And he's just really casual about it. He's like, yeah, like, our hospitals are bad. Like, yeah, I've lost, like, three kids. Like, mm-hmm. he just tells him. And what I like about this is that he doesn't, like, fetishize his experience and say, oh, this is the real Uras. Mm-hmm. He, you know, like that, the real America kind of bullshit. Yeah. And, and he realizes that, no, this isn't the real one. They're both real and they're both connected. Like, yes. they're causal. Yeah. And yeah. I one thought that was so One requires the other. Important. Yeah. It's just interesting to see how different they are. Uh, Shevek had never seen a rat or an army barracks or an insane asylum or a poor house or a pawn shop or an execution or a thief or a tenement or a rent collector, or a man who wanted to work and could not find work to do or a dead baby in a ditch. Jesus. So these were all commonplace horrors in f horror stories. And like he had purposefully not been shown those things for sure. Yeah. But it's interesting too that f horror kind of knows a little bit about Anaris from mm-hmm. his encounters and so because he says oh yeah all the same there's none of them there when he's talking about Anaris mm-hmm. and and Shavis like them he's like yeah the owners oh I love that <laughs> and he, he even says to say good luck to someone on Uras mm-hmm. if you're poor you'll say may you be reborn on Anaris and yes. I'm like oh that's so sad <laughs> yeah Another conversation with Artro says some more imperialist shit uh, my favorite slash least favorite line the common soldier has always been our greatest resource as a nation. Dude loves the troops. Mm, yeah. And he, <laughs> and he kind of explicitly says like, oh yeah, get them to fight for like their home country. Put a flag up there. They'll fucking die. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the worst. Imperialist. Shavik has had enough. Yeah. He runs away. Makes his escape. Um, he gets f to help him. And he basically sends him to this shop in this shady part of town, and he meets up with basically the people organizing a general strike. Yeah, Maeda. And they talk, and he's working with syndicalists, libertarians, and some socialist workers' union people. So it's a broad left, a united front. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, they're doing a general strike, and I love this. They, they say that Anaris is inspirational. Quote, they can never say again that it is just an idealist stream. And I'm like, man, I wish we could do that. That'd be yeah. great. <laughs> In some ways, I think our generation has some limited examples of like existing socialist states. Mm-hmm. And previous generations had like the Soviet Union and stuff. Despite the flaws that any of those have, to yeah. a lot of people, it's like, this is why maybe the left tries to be defensive about them. Mm-hmm. It's because it's something. You know? Yeah, and I think even here, even Shevik, knowing that his home world still has problems, he's he's still able to be like, well, it's better than this fucking shit. Like, yeah. he, he can see that. Mm-hmm. And he himself is sort of, they say, the idea of anarchism made flesh. He's sort of a symbol to them, too. Mm-hmm. Okay, I want to talk about this conversation. Yeah. So he's talking to Maida, and there's this girl there, Ciro, and she's just like, fucking let him come fight. I'm ready to fight. Mm-hmm. And... Maeda like kind of scolds her and he says, join them if you like their methods. Justice is not achieved by force. And I was like, is it though? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Cause she says, you know, power isn't achieved by passivity. Mm-hmm. And then he says, we're seeking the end of power. And I'm like, yeah, you're seeking that. But like, it's different. You didn't start on an empty ass moon. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're taking power away from someone. Uh, yeah, no, I thought this was the, they both kind of had good points here. 
you know, one of the big themes in the book, right, is that instead of means and ends, you're talking about like a gradual process, right? Mm -hmm. So, I don't know, because like power, it's not going to just concede willingly, right? That's it's not my just going to say, yeah. oh, whoop, fine, oh, sure. sure. And we see it does not. <laughs> Whether you're trying to take power from yourself or get rid of it, you mm -hmm. still have to confront power at some point. I mean, you could. Okay, so what Maid is saying, right, mm -hmm. is let's have a moral victory. We get killed by the cops on TV or something, mm -hmm. and then people change, right? Yeah. Or if you don't, if that maybe that doesn't work. Maybe you go get killed on TV and, and nothing changes. Yeah. You know, or it's not like Ciro is saying, I want to take control of the government, so I'm going to do no, violence. I don't think that's what she's saying, but it, she's saying we're going to have to do some violence to make sure they're not in, tr in control it, anymore. To defend ourselves, too, right? Yeah. Just that to too. show up and be like, I'm not going to get my ass beat. Yeah. Like, yeah. Why? And I you think know? that's fucking fair. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For sure. That's, I mean, an RS state used violence against each other when they have to mm -hmm. you know yeah, one of someone, the earliest scenes is someone fighting that's true yeah so you defend yourself yeah shevik offers to write a statement for the newspapers mm -hmm. and uh <laughs> classic some people get arrested and then some underground newspapers print it of course heck yeah and then they do a big march on like the capital they're singing they're marching they're feeling that solidarity he gives a cool speech this is his like revolutionary theory yeah Right there, he's out there, you know, he's talking about the unity of suffering, having nothing but freedom, talking about mutual aid, free association. I mean, I love the world that he describes here. Oh, it's beautiful. I want to live in a world right here. He says, no states, no nations, oh, yes. no presidents, no premiers, no chiefs, no generals, no bosses, no bankers, no landlords, no wages, no charity, no police, no soldiers, no wars. I literally just drew a heart under that page. <laughs> like, yes, I want it. This, please. Yeah. <laughs> and he, even, he says, uh, you cannot buy the revolution. You cannot make a revolution. You can only be the revolution. Oh, Shavik, is that a t-shirt? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he doesn't, I don't know. He doesn't mean it in this sort of like, sometimes I think that's a little, there is this it's notion of be the change or whatever. Mm -hmm. right? It's like, a, Oh, you've got to manifest it in yourself first before it can. Mm -hmm. And you do. I think that's mm, people kind of lean on that as being like, well, it's a personal endeavor. Yeah. But it's also a social and like you have to you have to connect people too. I think it's almost like the the self love bullshit of like you can't love someone else until you love yourself. Loving yourself isn't a one day process. That's a choice you make every single day. Mm -hmm. And same thing with loving someone else. That is a choice you make every single day. It's not a binary thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's what we see on Anaros is that. Anarchism is a choice every day. Yes. Yeah. You have to keep pushing. And so everyone heard his speech and they said, that's great. Let's, <laughs> Let's do all that. do yeah. it. And it's fine. End of book. Um, no. <laughs> the cops show up. Helicopters, machine guns, black coats, the whole thing. Uh, yeah. ACAB. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They start machine gunning people from helicopters. Just in the fucking like Capitol Square. Just mowing them down. Yeah, and Shevek realizes he was, you know, talking to Atro and saying, like, why is, you know, y'all's military is pretty unwieldy. It has oh, all yeah. this hierarchy. Like, you should have people making their own decisions. And he realizes why that hierarchy is there so that people will take orders like, shoot all these unarmed civilians. Yes, yes. I thought that was a really interesting passage. Eventually, Shevek makes it to the Terran embassy. He, like, is smuggled in a taxi. Because mm -hmm, the police are, like, going and rounding up the strikers and everything. Mm-hmm. So he talks with the Terrans, who I believe are just future Earth, right? They're Earth. And so this is actually the point in the... Well, they kind of like obliquely mention it as mm -hmm. we go on. But I just thought it meant that they were like very like hairy where hair normally is. Oh. But they like Shevik and the, the Anaresti and the Urasti are like hairier than us. Oh, I didn't catch that. I knew the Urasti shaved everywhere and that was weird. Terrans are described, she's described as having, the ambassador, mm -hmm. Kang is described as having a very smooth, childlike face. Oh, we're babies. Yeah. <laughs> and so I imagine these, you know, that Shevik and them are more like Planet of the Apes style. They're actually. werewolves. Yeah. I love that. I didn't even think about that. That's funny. It's hinted at before, I think, again, but like, I think it's... Yeah, that's true. More revealed they, they said uh, Takfer is kind of like furry. And I just thought, oh, she's just like got more body hair. But yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's initially what I thought too. So yeah, they're basically Earth. 
<laughs> way in the future. They fucked up their planet super bad with climate change. And so, yeah. I mean, this is what's going to happen. I hope this happens. Another world, <laughs> uh, the Hainish come and basically kind of save them. And they're like, here's space travel. If you survive to that point, though, because I mean, like, <laughs> oh, no, yeah. no forests. The air is gray. Always hot. We had made a desert from nine billion to half a billion. Jesus. <laughs> Plastic everywhere. Everything's totally centralized, totally rationed. The absolute regimentation of each life toward the goal of racial survival. Damn. That's what you have to endure before the Hainish show uh, up and, and help you. Yeah. The Hainish are so interesting to me. Yeah. I could not get a good read on them. I think they had destroyed a people at some point. Ooh, I like that theory. Because they talk about how they like move with a great sadness, how mm. they're so alt altruistic and everything, and and they're, they're all guilty. Yeah, it seems like they they've been around for so long. They at some point in their past had just you know been dicks. destroyed a system. Yeah, because okay, sorry, we're skipping a little bit ahead. <laughs> Basically, he decides to give his theory to everybody. He's like, "Fuck it, I don't want anyone to own this. We're gonna broadcast it to every physicist everywhere." Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I love this quote, though. He's, he says he realized there's no way to act rightly with a clear heart on Uras. And it's like, yeah, what are you going to do? We're living there now, and there isn't. You're right. <laughs> there really isn't. <laughs> they decide to broadcast it, and then he's going to go home on a heinous ship. And he, he interacts with them and, yeah, talks about how, like, kind of solemn these people are. And yeah. at, he's talking to one of the officers who actually asks to go with him to mm -hmm. visit Aeneas. And the officer's like, yeah, we've tried everything, like anarchism too. Like, we're just, we have such a long history that we've done basically everything. So I'm like, well, if you tried anarchism and stopped, I guess you didn't like it. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I'm super curious as to how that's that That's true. Worked. Yeah, I didn't think about that. Which means they tried fascism at some point. Maybe that's why, right, they're, so... That's why they're so sad. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's, he's heading home. He heard from his friends back home and basically the whole planet is stirred up. But like, sounds like he has more friends. Yeah, I thought that was very interesting because we've talked about this before on the show. Historical examples of people being like swept up in the moment. Fence sitters who were like, mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, before, beforehand, once shit pops off, you're going to get some more support, right? Like, I mean, yeah. Bolshevik example, there are people who are like, eh, I don't know about revolution, but once it happens, you know. They're on board. Yeah. I bet they were very proud of him. You know, like, man, you went and like started some shit on that capitalist planet. Good job, bro. Yeah, yeah. Nothing uh, Nothing succeeds like success. Yeah. They say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this Hainish officer's like, hey, can I come along? And he's like, yeah, I mean, I can't protect you because there's no government. So like, <laughs> it's your own call, man. I can't tell you what to do. Yeah. Um, and then he gets back home. That's the end of the book. It's a long one. It's, it's a, a good It's one. a long book. <laughs> it's a long episode, guys. Which planet would you rather live on? I mean, in ours for sure. You want to live through that famine? The, and... the famine sucked. The drought yeah. sucked. But it sounds yeah. cool. You only get two... Two meals. I Programmed do meals a day. Yeah, it's not scheduled. You can show up whenever. You can go to different ones, too. Yeah. That's true. It's not so bad. It sounds pretty cool. You get childcare. You can... It's just hard. That's the it's only It's hard. Thing. It is hard. But it sounds like it's worth it, in a way. Like, that big sense of community, it's got to be worth it. Yeah. I would, too, because it's cool. It's very cool. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think, again, it comes back to their planet is in such dire straits that, like, it has to be hard. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it just gonna, it's gonna suck until they can figure out how to, I guess, do enough terraforming where they can be more comfortable. Yeah. So it's gonna be a slow process. Eventually, I think it'll be a lot more com comfortable, but they're not there yet. And I'm super curious how it's gonna go now that there's faster than light communication. Will they open up more and... They'll have to figure something else out. Uh I think because it seems like Arasti is about to, you know, Pop gradually off. at least they're going to have some some more social tensions, mm -hmm. and maybe they can get some people, you know, exile some people to Anaris or something. I think that might happen because they they mentioned that yeah, there are some Odonians there that already wanted to come, mm -hmm. so that could happen. Yeah, it's just you got to have more rabble rousers on <laughs> Anaris to say, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. You know? I think we did all of our discussion kind of as we went, so we don't have a think, separate yeah. discussion section. <laughs> we're good. We're good. Um, <laughs> yeah, this was, a, I read this astonishingly fast. I'm a slow reader. I read fiction this was super fast. Really quickly, so <laughs> I eat it like a snack. Um, I gave it a, I think it a five out of five, which is pretty rare for me, but yeah. I loved it. Like, I think about it all the time. <laughs> Same. I've started just influencing me in a way, too. So, yeah. Five of five as well. Check it out. Find it at your local library. 
if you haven't read it, but you listen to this uh, <laughs> for some reason, that's fine. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> there's some good quotes in there we didn't say. So yeah, there's, there's, there's straight fire on most pages, I feel like. So yeah. I did a lot of underlining. Next week, we'll just be having a little discussion on education and maybe what that yeah. would look like under a communist or utopian system. Yeah, we, you know, mentioned it a little bit here. Mm -hmm. So we'll be drawing kind of on, a, on those sorts of ideas and a lot of others. So mm -hmm. check it out. All right. In the meantime, you can find us online. We are on Twitter at Teach Communism, Instagram at Teach Me Communism. You can send us an email at teachmecommunism at gmail.com. Any of those places are fine to send us questions or feedback or suggestions, all that stuff. You can also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps people find the show. And we like it and need it. <laughs> yeah. Please. And we're on YouTube, if that's how you prefer to listen to podcasts. And finally, we have a Patreon, patreon.com slash teachmecommunism. For $5 a month, you get access to our notes. We both took quite a few notes for this one. So, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll get both of them. And you'll also get access to the backlog. Okay. That's it, right? That's it. All uh, right, let's get out of here. Thank you guys for tuning in. Check us out next week on another episode of Teach Me Communism, where the class struggle is always in session. Bye, y'all. Goodbye. Goodbye.